Today, uh, the date is what day are we on, Mark? Because my watch is not working right. I don't know. Let's, let's have a look. I think it's 10th. <laughs> the 10th, 10th of October. 10th of October. Uh, not very far for me to travel today, which makes a nice change. Just come over the M1, sorry, A1 from where I live, uh, over to uh, Adwick Lee Street in Doncaster to meet, uh, I would say, he's become a a friend of mine, uh, a good friend, I've joined the club this year that Mark flies in and up until then I'd heard about him but never met him and, and to be fair what a, a gentleman he is as well as being a top top class fancier and when we go through this video you'll understand what I mean why I rate him so highly, uh, position he flies in and the results he gets at Fed level which is the rest of the Fed, it goes about 16 miles into east, but he's still tops fed uh, several times. So I've come to meet Mark Trinder, a good friend of Pat Alliwell's, and it was Pat that uh, mentioned Mark to me a while ago, and uh, Pat were right in everything he said. He, he's a working man, he's got a family, flies on allotment as well, which I always take my hat off to people. That, Personally, I'd find it very difficult myself uh, when you're working. It's much easier to be at home than it is on allotment. And as we go through, uh, I'll mention a few things why I really take my hat off to him because I'll get up at half four in the morning, taking my birth training. Bear in mind, Mark's got to go to allotment and basket his pigeons, and he were always there at the same place as me at stupid o'clock in the morning and then going and doing a day's work. So, Mark Trinder, Doncaster. Right, we'll start with, as I do with all my videos these days, I'm not just here to uh, show the pigeons, give all the results and just talk about that. I like to give you a bit of an insight as to how these people achieve what they achieve, what they feed, what supplements, training. So we're going to try and cover all that. And Mark is a bit like Pat was. Outside of Doncaster to a degree, not really a known name. And people I've spoke to recently, good flyers, uh, have asked me about him. I believe that given the platform, he will become a big name. His results and the class of pigeon he's got is absolute quality. So we'll start giving you an idea from now, which is 10th of October, Maltin's underway, what he does through Maltin, what he uses, and then we move into breeding. So when you see the pigeons and the results and the quality, you'll have an understanding as to how he achieves what he achieves which is the reason we're here today. So, Mark, thanks for having me, buddy. You're more than welcome, Chris. Thank you for making us a nice coffee. Uh, made me very welcome, as always. You fly in Woodlands HS. Yeah. Know the classic. Yeah. Uh, and Woodlands is in the Doncaster Fed. Donny Federation, yeah. Yeah. What are we in? Uh, 10th of October. So we'll start with Maltin. We'll go on about results shortly. Uh, but they're the organisations that Mark flies in. Are you a member at Midland National as well? Yeah, I am. I've not flown in it for probably the last two or three years. Like I say, when we had COVID and everything, just where we could basket and so on. It more yeah, yeah. Sheffield area. So I've not competed in it. Uh, Logistics. I, yeah, yeah, I think last year I competed in it. I might have been 2018 maybe, I think. Yeah, maybe yeah. that was last yeah. time. Um, Predominantly sprint, yeah, yeah, uh, and outstanding at it as well. So, 
what's from Neymar, obviously another successful season, yeah. without a shadow of a doubt, and I've witnessed it because I'm in the same club, uh, and I very rarely get a look in, I'll be openly honest with that. Uh, from now then, your last race with Young Birds, what's your routine, if you have a routine as yeah. such? Just for malting. Yeah, to be honest with you, it starts off extremely simple and I'm sure a lot of lads do exactly the same. So every bit of corn I've got left, all goes in. Literally, yeah. everything just goes in and, and so on. And then I finish that off uh, yeah. and everything has it. So everything I've added in any kind of pots goes into one big one, mix it all together, feed them and once that's gone, then I go on to uh, beans. Yeah. Yeah, beans. Um, and I've done this for quite a few years and the first time I ever did it, um, pigeons, they do the pick around and, yeah, and they don't want to yeah. eat them. <laughs> but what I find is <clears throat> it's always helped me uh, with pigeons not putting weight on. Yeah. So I find they only eat enough. They don't necessarily yeah. make the, and, and because I will go on them, do they? they don't. And um, up until two years ago when I changed my career, I were always struggling for time at that point. Yeah. So I found beans were great because I could literally um, just feed them all up in the morning and then I'd go back next morning and feed them all up again. And uh, it weren't as if I were feeding a, a mix where they would just literally just pig out yeah. on all that mix yeah. and so on. And I found that when you then go, go through a mold because it's not a protein going through the, uh, yeah. you get new feathers coming on the, the the better feathered and i just found the condition of the pigeons seem to feel better yeah. with that um i don't particularly have a routine as such because i'm always pleased season's over when it's over yeah. Yeah. work hard during the season so this is like the play time family and i go on holiday in autumn time and yeah. so on so it's literally more around um i just Put the tools down, September's finished, young bird season's finished. I separate my cocks and ends, and my race birds have usually been separated. My stock birds have already been separated. Yeah. They're already in aviaries, they're already kind of molting through. My young birds, young cocks go with the uh, my racing cocks, my young ends go with my racing ends. And then, literally, like I say, in terms of a routine, they get fed in the morning. And then they get fed the next morning and it just goes on and on. On once a weekend. A, once a day. Once a day. Literally, I feed them up once a day because they're out of work and so yeah. on. And even though it's quite light at this time of year in October, I could get down on an evening. I've had enough of them. They want yeah, some yeah. time away yeah. from me, me away from them. Yeah. I spend more time with family and so on. And so literally, it's just a case of... Um, as soon as season's finished, I just literally cut the cloth and Deep that's breath. It done. Deep <laughs> breath and so on. Yeah. Um, and that's realistically in terms of water i maintain and i'll talk about the products in a bit i do maintain what i put in the water through the close season as well because although my feed goes on to beans and i think it's a good product uh, my water i still look at some of the products that i use because i still think they need additives coming into the body yeah. and so on so i don't take my foot off the gas completely but i most certainly in my own time just steady steady everything down right so that's through your malting. Yeah, products for malting. So again, what you'll feel gives them a bit extra that they need growing feathers. Yeah. Uh, so condition. So I use um, I use the Comed products and I, I use them for racing and so on. And then within the Comed products, um, what what you'll see when I start to show is is around the um, well, the, there's two products actually. The yeah. main main two that I use. Um, this Lissacure, which goes in the water, they have that twice a week, on yep. a Monday and a Wednesday. And, uh, and Ronnie, they have this in the water also twice a week and so on. And within these, this, this is, I feel really good for the intestines. It's got like a lot of garlic and other additives in it. And I, I just feel the quality that that provides the feathering is just second to none. Yeah. Um, so I continue with this and they have this um they'll have this all the way through the winter it's an expensive way i must admit but i feel it it, it most certainly does work so that they have this sorry i would just lice secure yeah they do they do a drop called lice secure no? they, they do do the drop as and well this, is, this this keeps the respiratory clear yeah which people some people don't think when they're molting is an important thing but things like the respiratory tract the intestines yeah uh 
everything's got to be spot on all year round. Hasn't yeah, it? and that's what I, because I'm not exercising them, because I'm not working them. All I'm wanting to do this time of year is for them to molt out. Yeah. Just literally, just get the cells into a, a good position, but you've still got to keep yeah. the insides of the bodies right. You, what you don't yeah. want to do, in my opinion, is wait to ready for breeding season, then suddenly, you, you, I'm not saying you would have problems, but you start to kind of think to yourself, right, well, I need to get ready for breeding, and inside, they're not healthy. I yeah. find that these products keeps them healthy, keeps them clean. Exactly, so that goes on the corn. Yeah, th that, that one's in the water, sorry. Sorry, that one's in water. That's in the water. And then what I do is, is, is that where I get it from, it doesn't come in this, it comes in a big tub, but I put it into that one because it's easier to handle. And yeah. this is called Commodore. Commodore, like I said, a cold. Yeah, it is, yeah. This, this, this that Commodore. in the water as well? Yeah, in water. It's like really garlic. Yeah, yeah. Same time. Life's cure. No, alternate days. So that, alternate that, days. That goes in the water on a Monday and a Wednesday, and that goes in on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Yeah, it's very garlic. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. And that's good for the day, for what yeah. it says. Acidic intestine, alpha intestine. Yep, and the Commodore, that goes on the corn um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday um, as a racing, which we'll come on to uh, at a later date, but I also use it on the corn at least four or five days a week as well, because again, with this, um, and then a product that I add with this one is called uh, the Myobel, which is the muscle power yeah. and so on. Um, this is used more so in racing and ready for breeding because when you're, you're, you're breeding for your young birds what you're wanting to do is start to help the muscles grow yeah. and so on but I, 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 think, I think it's also a fantastic product to be honest with you to help even your stock pigeons yeah. kind of gain, gain that metabolism around how the, how the handle, how the fitness is and yeah. so on. So that goes on, on the corn with this um, and the... Um, and that again will continue throughout all the winter months. What I will say, and I had a, a young lad come to me the lot the other day. Man. Yeah, that's Commodore, like I say, it comes in a bigger tub, but I just yeah. pour it into that for easy use. So this, on the before we start talking about young, uh, you know, about young Rui. Yeah. So this, a lot of people I know don't use it as often as that. Mm -hmm. But I feel, obviously like you do, because you use it quite a lot, mm -hmm. that a Sedacol type product, or Commodore as, as Mark uses, is extremely important. And I, when my youngsters, I mean I don't race old birds, but when my youngsters have finished racing, I'll put them on a Sedacol product yeah. for like three weeks solid. Uh, and when they start drop into bits then I get them three times a week yeah. similar to you I think the fact that it aids the liver to get as much or get all the nutrients from feed and any supplements the liver's processing it which in turn helps the feathering it's just really really like silk yeah and I think a lot is, is down to that but one of the things I noticed when I started to use all these products, and, yeah. and if anybody goes onto the kind of the Comed site, you've got William De Bruyne talking, and he uses the Comed products, there, and this is a kind of a reason why I'm using it. But I think when you get someone like William, he, he talks very articulately about why he uses the yeah. specific products. Um, what I was going to say was that what's important, I again, I feel is that even though I personally take my foot off the gas after the season's finished and I have a good break as well as the birds have a good break, the additives that I'm giving the pigeons will be uh, remain. But the other reason I think is important, and as, as I said, I had a, a young lad come to me off the other day, and what I said was that I use a lot of these, well, I use these products when I'm breeding. Pigeons like us in terms of taste and so on, and you put certain products on food, and the yeah. worst thing I think that you can have is suddenly introduce something when they're breeding and the pigeons are picking and not eating properly to feed the young birds because of the taste that they've got. Yeah. By giving them this the way that I give them throughout their you know, 12 months uh, of the year, they're used to that taste, mm. so there's no changes for them. So they'll feed the young birds exactly the same as they will eat for their yeah. own kind of satisfaction. And what I said to the, uh, young Roo when he came over to us was literally, don't just introduce it at the time when you've got youngsters in the nest because you may yeah. find the, mm. the parents start picking through food rather than um, 
doing it. So they're just things that I kind of do. And um, But again, on with the malt, what I find is, is, is that this just assists that and the feathering of the pigeons. I just feel that they're more silkier. Um, I mean, the kind of pigeons I, I, I have anyway, um, they're always very kind of silky in the, um, the, the way that they handle. But I think this these products just enhance that as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really, in, in wintertime, use anything else, uh, really. I don't have a, um, I don't treat, I don't, um, uh, you know, think I need to go through a routine now and coxie canker and all that season's finished. Mm. I, 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 don't, I don't tend to do that because um, I believe my pigeons are clean when they're finished racing. Mm. And I, again, any questions you've got on medication, I'll, I'll, I'll answer. And that would probably answer why in close season this time of year I don't bother treating. Yeah. So we'll go through medication in a bit and speak about vets as well that Mark will openly talk about. As we everyone I, I deal with, I only deal with them because they're honest people and it will tell you very honestly we've had a chat prior to recording about the vets and how many times he goes and, and what he gives them. So Maltin's coming to an end Mark. Yeah. We'll move into breeding. Yeah. Uh, how do you go about, do you prepare you, if you're changing pairs, do you prepare them and, and introduce them so it makes it easier on the day and just put them together? How do you go about that and, firstly, after the malt's finished, do you, I know you've just touched on it, but do you treat your stock pigeons for anything? So, so although I don't treat this time of year, when I, I usually pair up around about December time. Yeah. So, of uh, course, by the time I come off my holiday, which I'm going next week, and uh, so you go on holiday, uh, come back refreshed, and I'll be honest with you, like uh, most pigeon people out there, we all start looking at his books and seeing what we're wanting yeah, to, to yeah. look at. The certain pairs I have are already the, the sacrosanct, they'll go back together because yeah. they're the, the bred uh, proven pigeons for, for some time now. So they're other pigeons, pigeons I introduce, might switch a few pairs around. I start putting them on paper first. Yeah. Um, I, I, I pair up now based on my line of pigeons rather than literally just um, pairing up on a, a, a spontaneous kind of I like that bird, I like that bird. I try and keep my lines with, the, there are other families but three main families yeah. which we'll talk about and so on and then with those pigeons I kind of uh, pair accordingly with, mm. within that. As for getting the birds ready for pairing up, what I will do, I will have a vet visit um, and look at getting everything tested and so on. Um, I'll vaccinate, I vaccinate twice a year, all my pigeons get vaccinated at least twice a year. Um, that's with either Columbavac or Novavac and yeah. so on. I keep on top of that side of things and so on. So they'll be jabbed up, they'll have a fortnight's rest from that and then only if the vet have said there's any coxie canker worms or anything like that present mm. uh, which there never has been over the last few years uh, then I'll treat only if yeah. there is something I won't just routinely think right I'm going to go and treat them now um, I'll only treat if if there is a, a an issue that mm. comes back from a vet report mm. uh, so we'll talk about vets shortly but so breeding time a vet visit yeah I, I, yeah, I take my stuff over to uh, vets. I use Standill Vets out at Thirsk. I've used them for a few years now. Um, there's two young is it, vets there. Is it Laura, the young, the, yeah, there's Laura, Laura and there's Dan. And they Dan, took over yeah. from a, 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 a guy called Richard. Richard was uh, the he, he owned uh, Standill Vets. These guys have took over. The young, they're enthusiastic, and and to be honest with you, I think they're very good avian vets. Yeah. All those pigeon men become experts over the years, and but there's loads of vets on Facebook. Oh, right? they, 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 there's, there's thousands. But what <laughs> what I've learned is is that um, my knowledge is is um, superficial compared to oh, talking yeah. to them. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll talk about my birds to them. They do the tests. And, and for the tests, the basic tests I have is just your normal ones. They do a, um, a swab down the throat, a swab up the back end, any bacterial infections. They do a coxie count, obviously worms, canker. Mm -hmm. Look at the, the basics of those. Um, but I don't give any broad spectrum antibiotic in terms of if there is anything. I hear often people will say, I'll give them a, a broad spectrum to see if there's anything to clear it all up. I, I don't do that. I, I literally, if, if I think... 
if you think there's something wrong with your birds, um, I'll go and check that out to see if there is. Not necessarily just give something out there hoping that I have um, I've hit the nail on the head. I don't do that at all. But um, so prior to breeding, I've wrote all my pairings down and so on. I've vaccinated because I do believe I got bit, oh God, about 15, 20 years ago when uh, I got a, um, a disease in loft, which I thought were um, paratyphoid. And uh, and so a paramyx, so sorry, not paratyphoid. There were birds were vaccinated against it, but I got it. But so I'm a bit paranoid now, where everything gets yeah. done twice a year. Um, so once that's done, droppings, pigeons to vets. If everything's good, then we're all 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 ready to go. You asked in terms of what I do around the pairings and and so on. So I don't prepare. Um, I have everything written down how I want to do it and uh, to the day I'll take a, uh, a couple of days off work or to be on a weekend on a nice nice day let's say in December um, I will then put the ends behind the um, the fronts yeah. uh, let the cocks literally see the ends and so on they, they won't touch each other um, and I'll probably do that for, at the end of that day take the ends out put them back into their section so they can feed and, and so on next day put the ends back into that uh, probably after day three, I'll start letting one pair out at a time or let one pair into each other. The pairs that have been together for years now and so on, that's fine, that's different. They know each other, that we know whether or not. But if I've got a young cock or introduced a new stock bird in, I don't know how he's going to respond to N. I don't want him battering her and also vice versa. I don't want her battering in in some cases that does happen. Um, and so over probably three days, drip feed them, coming in, coming out. Yeah. Um, I have tiers, I have boxes, the, the Petron boxes I have in my stock loft. So I have a, a, a tier of four across the top, four and so on. So what I'll do is I'll stagger them, maybe box one out, maybe uh, box five out and, and, and so on. So they're at different locations. Sorry, not late, too. The reason we talk, I know this might be like teaching most fanciers to suck eggs. But there is some fanciers, what I've raised pigeons years, still don't do what most of us see as a bit of common sense. So you don't let box one, box two yeah. out, you let box one yeah. and maybe box six down, you know, down here. Yeah. yeah. One of the reasons, Chris, I find is, is that when things become a little bit chaotic in a shed, yeah. I think then when the cock's driving the end, obviously within probably a two or three day window, you've got first egg to last egg in, yeah. in well I experienced that anyway yeah. what you don't want if cocks have been boisterous and other boxes going in and breaking your eggs exactly. and then suddenly your breeding starts to be you start being 20 some days behind each other yeah. and so on and therefore your young birds are staggered you've got your first round there but then you've got some coming over and others have then gone down on another round and it starts yeah. to get a bit particularly when you're having a young family and working what you don't want to be doing is having uh, bringing a squeaker into your team yeah. at different stages. So I find yeah. this way prevents a lot of that from happening. Yeah. It doesn't stop it, but it does prevent it a little yeah. bit. No, I agree. I agree. I think I think people will get egg, egg smashed, and you do hear it every year. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I've had six eggs smashed, and I've had ten eggs what are clear. Clear eggs, I think, is down to... The pigeons, what you've said, they look great on outside. They've had them all. They look, they look fantastic, but they're not right inside, uh, which is why I touched on products that Mark gives them, and what he does prior to pairing, because to get clear eggs and a lot of them, is something not right with pigeon. Uh, so by giving them them products, getting them checked with a vet keeps them right, and I think that's why very few. A lot of top fanciers have very few clear eggs and that's the reason why. They don't just give them plain corn water, they're still looked after. Maybe not spending a lot of time, but they're still looked after with, with yeah. products. Yeah. So, that's malting and breeding. Uh, the next one is the all important racing. Right, we're on to racing. Mark races cocks and hens uh, we'll speak about young birds later but cocks and hens both of them getting amongst prizes as I've witnessed this year so we'll speak about when your young birds 
that obviously in race loft when your young birds are almost ready to be weaned off. Yeah. Do you just leave a, co a young bird with cock or do you part them off with ends like and rear them? How do you go about weaning them off? And when you've weaned your young birds, what do you do? Do you give them, a lot of people give them quarter of flagell or when do you jab them, everything. What do you do when you win your young birds? Right, so I'll start back to front. So in terms of jabbing, yeah. um, I jab my birds in nest around about 10 to 12 days. This was something I learned off Macaloni's was that they used to, uh, when the pigeon didn't have a lot of feathers, it just found it easier, go to the nest, yeah. uh, paratyphoid, paramyxo, and yeah. um, and therefore they were, they, were, they were vaccinated at that uh, at that age. So I've kind of inherited what they they do. Both vaccines. Both vaccine. Well, a lot of them now vaccines are kind of um, they are together. So uh, I use the Vetchroda one. I, I I always use Columbavac or Norbavac because then you're kind of that's what's supposed to use in this they're country. The ones we, they're, yeah. they're the ones that we're supposed. So I always make sure that that's one of them. But I do vaccinate uh, um, in terms of using other products. But I'll vaccinate them initially with the Clumbervac or Norbivac um, and, uh, and and probably an herpes one at yeah. around about 10 to 12 days. They'll have that in the, in the nest. Is that the PHA? From, yeah. 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 Par so they get another dose of yeah. Paramix or yeah. Yeah. herpes and a Dino. Yeah. Now, a vet did say to me there was no need for me to do it at that age because they carry the parents' immunities yeah. with, within them. There's no need. That may be the case, but I've always done it, so I'm going to continue to do it yeah. and, and, and so on. So I never break away from that. So I'll vaccinate my birds while they're still in the nest and so on. Uh, when they get to round about, I don't know, uh, 20, 21 days, I leave them quite late, 20, 21 days, um, I will, again, usually from the first to the last egg in my race teams, three days possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the, so whatever date the youngest one is, I wean them all together with the hens. So the hens and the young birds go into the hens racing section. The young birds go on the floor on, on shavings or straw or both, and the hens go in there and the hens will finish the young birds the off. All of them. The cocks then are on widowed. So yeah. at that point, the, the, the cocks. So the young birds are in there with the mums. That's what's happening. And then what I'll do is, in terms of an age of a young bird, I'm more interested in making sure that they're covered under the, fully, the, covered. The, fully covered under yeah. there. They've got the protection, and I'll also look at the weather as well. If it's absolutely freezing cold and it's bitten, ice is um, on water, yeah. I'll leave them for a few days. Mm -hmm. There's no rush for me. I'm not in a rush to try and get the ends into the sky or anything. Let them finish off. I have, though, made a few mistakes over the years. Sometimes I've left them too long together and a few ends have started pairing up because on the floor... You find a few like, eggs amongst yes, the babies. It's yeah. nice and comfortable. It's a bit like, you know, straw, yeah. shavings. They the yeah. start mousing down and, and so on. And uh, So it, it is a bit of a fine line, but once I realise it's a nice day, mm. I'm going to be weaning young birds. They all go over together again on shavings. The ends are then completely cleaned out and they're also then at yeah. that point on Widward. I don't second pair. Some people have their round and uh, and then reintroduce them and pair them back up. I don't do that at all. Mm. I kind of work it out. It's like a 91-day cycle from first race to when I pair them up. So they'll literally just have one round and then they go on to Widward. Yeah. So we'll speak about ends in a bit. Yeah. So babies in a way. Yeah. With the race ends, uh, they finish them off uh, and finish them off really well. Uh, anyone who's done it, they do finish them yeah. off really well. And cocks, so your cocks are on with you from that day. Yeah. What's your program now as regards exercise and treatments and vets? Yes. So this is probably where I may differ from a lot of people in terms of. So at that point, when I've weaned them off, so I'll, I'll pair up. My stock birds in December, my race birds is usually around about Blackpool weekend, 19, yeah. something like that, when we come back from Blackpool and I pair race birds up and so on. So my birds don't go out over winter. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't let them fly out. Um, and that's due to me, what we were saying earlier on about the time, time for yeah. me and time yeah. for them. They don't go out. So at the time when the young birds have weaned on, that's the time to start looking letting cocks starting to look outside and letting them fly out mm. the downside to that arrangement which i've 
two years ago I, I, I got significantly hit by uh, spiral oaks pigeons weren't fit they, yeah, they, yeah. they weren't flying they were coming out they were kind of sitting ducks and so on so you have to really where where i'm at lofts as you know is on back of woods yeah. and so i really have to watch what i'm doing and so on but start getting the cocks out at that point letting them have that freedom and as everybody will know the cock automatically within a day, two days of Ellen yeah. Young going, they stop sulking, they're starting to kind of uh, look around and starting to act the part a little bit. And I find that they, they go out at that point, start going up into the sky. I'm on an allotment, so there's always birds out usually. My cops will start feeding into all the kind of batches flying about and, um, uh, and they start to then get themselves fit. Yeah. Feeding then, uh, what we didn't speak about actually, what do you rear on? Yeah, so in terms of rearing, I use a either a breed and wean. So again, I protein, yeah. your peas uh, and so on. But I also leave beans in there as well. Yeah. A lot of times they leave the beans, they leave the beans as a last kind of resort and so on. But it's usually a high protein mix uh, that I use. I'm never and, and still now not really precious about um, what I feed uh, for breeding as long as it's a good clean corn um, and where I've got it from is a reputable place and so on. I use BGFs over at, uh, yeah. uh, in Sheffield, uh, get their corn, get any, any other corn that I like at that time and that's what they get. But primarily a breed and wean. And the reasons why I use a lot of those breed and wean kind of corns is when the young birds are weaned off, again, they're having the same as what there was actually yeah. reared on. So, and the breed and wean will, for me, help a young bird start to kind of develop themselves into, mm -hmm. into that young bird kind of status yeah. from a squeaker. Beans, yeah. when you're rearing, is that because, as, as a working, working man, yeah. you haven't always got the time to be there uh, and be feeding them? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I do think beans is a, a, a product that, is uh, is underrated some people say it needs to go on to bread and uh, and so on but uh, I, i've used beans for I, I don't know a long long time since uh, oh god I, I don't like to think how long I've, I've used beans i just think it is a good product as long as the beans uh, are clean and healthy not just some horse beans or beans with lots of uh, uh lols in it Weevil and so on and yeah that. just nice clean beans uh, and and that but once Early on, I talked about in the winter time, birds uh, uh, are molting through on beans. What I find is once they start getting a breeding wean or even maybe a, a little bit of a, um, a breeding mix in there, uh, they'll start leaving the beans and so yeah. on. But when they're hungry, they will eat them. Uh, yeah. And, and the only reason I ask that is, like when I'm breeding, because of work, I'll give them a good mixture in the morning. Yeah. What I'll have products on. Yeah. Which. Uh, We've already mentioned, and then I'll give them a, a, a mixture, a breeding mixture at night in the pots. Yeah. If I'm on afters, I have to put it in at dinner time and leave them. Mm. But I generally use a hopper with beans in. Yeah. What they can create, what they can use, yeah. which they will if yeah. if they haven't got any other. Yeah. And while I'm at work, if, I, if I'm on afters, they fed in the morning, fed at dinner time, but they've always got beans to feed. You know, yeah. It just helps me. Yeah. Uh, and that's. Yeah, well, it's, it's quite similar, really. Like I said, there's, obviously, when you're rearing birds, you've got to have food in front of them all the time. Yeah. You know, the, a pigeon will know when its young bird needs to be uh, fed. Um, we need to just make sure that they've got the right stuff there with a, a balance. Now, um, the, the products that I use offers a wide range of nutrients for the birds yeah. anyway. So yeah. It isn't just that they're just being reared on beans or breed and wean or even a mix and whatever. They've got the nutrients of the products that I give them as well. So, so it's not just relying on the natural source of protein coming from the corn. It's literally a balance out there. And, I, and so I feed first thing in the morning because I go to work and so on. And as we start to get the lighter days coming in into March and so on, you know, I've more than likely probably will call after work and just make sure everything's okay yeah. and top everything all up. Yeah. I mean, whereas yourself, you, your, your hours are restricted. Two years ago, I changed my career, went self-employed to allow me more time with my birds. I had that luxury yeah. to do that. So I will finish work around about three o'clock time and just check them over. It's still light enough. Um, 
at, uh, so yeah. they've got food in front of them all the time. Right. We've gone, up, we've gone off tangent a bit there because we didn't speak about the feed uh, when rearing, uh, when breeding in that section. So cocks start going out, getting themselves fit. Yeah. Let's take it from there. Yeah. Do, do you strip them? No, after the after young birds are away, do you strip them down a bit? They, they, they have 100% uh, depurative. Yeah. They have a depurative and they'll stay on that depurative until about three or four days before the first race. Right, yeah. So when they get themselves fit, yeah. what products do you move on to and what? At what time do you do that and when does your vet come? Yeah, so in terms of the depurative, as soon as I've weaned those young birds and the hens out, so we've got rid of then the breeding wean, the beans, that's all gone with the hens, that's gone. Yeah, yeah. The pots are all cleaned out. I feed still. I feed all my cocks on the floor. I don't feed them individual pots in, in the nest boxes. Put the tray out, they go under depurative, that single second. As they move out, that's when yeah. we change everything all over. They go on that, and like I said, they'll stay on that right up to uh, ready for the first race. So um, the products that's on there, it's the same as what I was doing before. They have the Comed products on yeah. there, so the taste and everything's in there. All we've done is change from having the different texture of a, a bean or a pea mm -hmm. onto the barley, the white yeah. dairy, wheat, yeah. and so on, as a, as a, um, as that would do. So that's that's what they they would have, and um, so the product side of things will remain to be the same twelve months in twelve months out of the year, yeah. but the corn will start to change at that point. Yeah. So within a couple of weeks, they're going out. They'll start really working. Yeah. As they do, they've yeah. got to be soaking. Yeah. They gain themselves fit. They're enjoying their exercise. Yeah. But what part will you? At what time will you get the baskets out? So, I'm not a big trainer. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not a big trainer, not for any other reason. Or, uh, you know, I can make time and so on. Um, I like to get the pigeon naturally fit, fit around the shed. That's the most important thing for me. Um, Do you believe they have to be fit before you even start with baskets? Uh, preferably, I do believe that. Mm. And I'll tell you why. I think... Um, I'm not saying I know this for a fact, but um, I know a lot of colleagues in in our PG world will talk to me about having wing lock and uh, mm. and, and so on. Um, my belief on that is sometimes with wing lock, it's based upon that pigeon has overexerted itself yeah. and its muscles and so on. I played football as a young lad and, and, and played into uh, adulthood and played at a good level. And I know pre-season training were massively important on stretching, keeping muscles yeah. lubricants. So by a pigeon flying naturally, it naturally builds its muscles up. It naturally gets itself fit. It's not just going in at 100 miles an hour. That's right. When you take a bird training, it's learned from a young bird, and which it will never lose that. It goes out of a basket and it, go, oh. it, it goes home and sometimes it overexerts itself and so on. Um, so as, as much as I physically can is get the pigeons as fit as I think that they need to be before I start looking yeah. at a basket. Yeah. Um, so that's how I would do that. And roughly, I know you, it's only rough, it can't be set in stone. How many weeks prior to the first race will you give them the first toss and how far will it be? I know what your regular spot yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you go so, straight to no, that? No, no, not at all. To be honest with you, I'm um, I'm a bit of a coward, really. So what I do is, an old friend of mine has passed away now, but he, he, he said to me, when you're teaching your bears widowwood, you can do one or two things. Yeah. You can take them for five, ten miles, whatever, and do one chuck or two chucks a day if you're working. Or if you take them a lot shorter, you can get three and four chucks in. So I've always adopted that. So what I tend to do with my widowed pigeons, the first ever chuck is usually between half and one mile. And they're coming back to the partner. Right. And vice versa. So That would be next yeah, question. Yeah, so I, I have to teach them widowed. Sometimes, for, for, for anybody out there who's got um, a seasoned team, so maybe three two-year-olds, yearlings, and so on, they, I do believe sometimes the yearlings will pick up what the two year olds and what yeah. you know that they'll teach them for anybody maybe just flying yearlings and so on i think it's massively important that we teach them what they want to do mm. they, they need to understand widow they need to understand what is the benefit of the motivation so what i tend to do is is that i have three sections mm. um uh, uh 40 cocks 40 45 ends something like that 
And what I tend to do is um, I will take uh, the cocks half a mile of a mile and then come back. And usually when they come back, they don't know ends in there. Yeah. So they mess about, they're flying all Clapping over. Around. So I'll leave them until the last one goes into the shed, then I take the ends. Yeah. And I do this on a nice day and I'll usually get three or four trucks in. Mm. It takes me a bit of time and nine times out of 10, by the time I've done that last chuck, They've gone like that, straight home, straight in. They ain't clapping around. They're, no, not clapping at all. I put my ETS on to kind of prove to myself where they're at. And and literally, uh, by the time they've done the fourth chuck, uh, they've, they've realised my partner's there. Another thing what I will do as well um, is sometimes on the last chuck, put the cocks and ends up together so they're all coming home together. So I'm not afraid of doing that and, uh, and, and so on. Now, once I've got them knowing what widow's like, I then can take them a little bit further. Yeah. And when I take them a little bit further, um, all, all my race birds have been trained and educated as young birds, so, which they never lose that kind of knowledge that they've, that they've got from then. So um, I would take them probably, first took about 12 miles, we have a place called Blythe, and yeah, uh, yeah. around about, I'll take them there. I think it's 12 miles for me, that. Um, and um, I'll have a couple there, and then I'll have a few over at uh, Clumber Park, which is, I think it's about 19 to 20 miles from there. And I think if they have, ignoring the half or one mile chucks, I think I probably have five or six chucks mm. before the first race and that's it. And that's it. I, 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 don't, I don't bother because that's what I was saying about them being naturally fit. Once they're naturally fit and they're flying out, and in this time, if time I get through to Columbia Park, the, the, the 19, 20 mile mark, my birds, when I've been letting them out, they're now starting to understand what this is This is about. Yeah. So the cocks are flying, the ends are flying, they're all flying really well. Um, so the fitness is in there. All I'm doing is taking them, is literally educating them, just reminding them yeah. it's a bit further, A to B and so on. Um, but if I couldn't get those four or five chucks in them, it wouldn't bother me at all. I'd, I'd just stick to probably 12 miles and that'd be it. I'd, yeah. I, I don't think distance, personally, is a um, is needed. I know a lot of fancies that would, would argue with me and that's mm. fine, but for me, I don't think you need to go distance for a racing pigeon. When it's fit, you shouldn't take a pigeon far distance to get it fit. That's ridiculous. I think what you have to do is take a pigeon um, just short, again, go back to my footballing days, pre-season, it was short sprints, short sprints, yeah. and you're building yourself up. Yeah. So that, for me, I think, and obviously we're on the same wavelength, training's not to get a pigeon fit, it's to learn it how to get home as fast as it can. Yeah. To get fit right off. Yeah. The other thing I'll say, Chris, on, as well, yeah. was that um, the federation we're in, um, other than our club, we are the significantly most westerly club in there and, and, and everybody else is significantly in the east yeah, of us. Yeah. So it's massively important that we do have a kind of where the pigeons will break. Mm. Um, and, and I find that Clumber Park, where that is, 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 is around about that area where our pigeons will break yeah. and, uh, and so on. So also the training is just around literally, oh, I, you know, that's where I go training, so I know I'm going home. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's where they, they'll two just break off yeah. at that point. And that's... From a part and works up turn off works up, yeah. the A1, which obviously is, is not far from here. Yeah. So you work that A1. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not answer to this, but yeah. you will not go over that 20 mile no. mark. No, I, I, I just don't. Back in the day, I, I've done silly chucks and gone silly miles and so on, and it's paid no detriment yeah. or no benefit to, to what I'm doing yeah and it just takes my time up because I like to be I like, I, well I very rarely see my birds come back and I always put my ETS on but I, um, I don't I ain't got a lot of time to get them down to come back yeah. to pick my leg up for work and then go to work so yeah. it's literally just that short distance but again personally I don't believe the need distance uh, mm. to to achieve so when baskets are out so to yeah. speak yeah uh, supplement wise yep so again 
I don't deviate away from um, this, but what I start to introduce as we're getting closer to that rating and so on, I start to use uh, simple things that a lot of people will use yeah. in terms of uh, using impact. Yeah. Um, I think iron is one of the products that, to be honest with you, is underrated in a lot of yeah. ones. Iodine and B12. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Starting doing that and obviously blitz form as well. Which is... Which is similar. Almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, they have impact probably on a, maybe definitely a Thursday, but sometimes I, I like to give iron in the week as well. So sometimes I might put it in Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe Thursday sometimes, mm -hmm. and then uh, they have this on a, on a Friday uh, and, and so on. But again, it all depends where we're racing and what the wind is as well. Because sometimes I don't think they need a lot of... Um, B12 when they're just flying a short distance and if the wind's going to be up the back side yeah. you don't need to overdo it what do you uh, why why do you use that and that and that it's again it's something I've always done I think that in terms of if I'm right the, the impact has a lot more kind of iron in it there's another product that I do use I've not got it here which is called action iron yeah. and, um, and and so on so I just think this has more iron in it that has more kind of B12 base that's my interpretation of it yeah. and um, and that's the one I just use on a Friday five mil to two liters any particular reason why you don't just give uh, blitz for midweek? No, it's something I've never done, but there's no, there's no reason. I don't think by reading both of them, there's too much difference between no. e that, that, either. That, yeah, that's why I asked. Yeah. Apart but from it, price. Price it, is a lot different. Well, yeah, possibly. Possibly. But again, it's something... Uh, I'm kind of a guy of routine, so... Yeah. If I've been successful and I use something, I very rarely change it out. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll have started to kind of introduce on a, uh, a Thursday is on a Wednesday night, I mix uh, this. is this, Now, this isn't for racing pigeons. A, a, a fancier um, yeah. put me into this yeah. many years ago. Uh, and this is for um, quite a carp, basically. And what I do is 10 mil to a kilogram of corn. And mix it, makes it all go yellow, and this kills all kind of fungus, yeah, uh, and so on. So any kind of fungal that's that's in there. So um, I don't treat medication randomly, but anybody that would kind of use sporadic medications, mm -hmm. as we know, kind of candida can kind of build up within yeah. the, the the crop and so on. And rather than using a nice statin each and every time, every Thursday morning's feed, whichever food I give them, will have got this on. Mm -hmm. And so with, with this product, what I find is, is that uh, I've never, throughout any of my vet checks, they've ever come up with uh, that I've ever, ever had candida. So Pat Alliwell, a uh, friend of mine, they'll say, ah, oh, do you know it works? And the truth is, I don't know it works, but it <laughs> makes me think it works. So <laughs> Pat so, says that about everything. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. But like I say, because I test regular vets, I've never had um, uh, any candida uh, whatsoever. Um, and with this product, why I think it's, it, it's a good product, it's a proactive product. What yeah. you're doing is, is that any kind of fungal in, with inside the, the crop, um, it's eliminating at that yeah. point. And it's done on a Thursday morning because if there is anything that's growing in there, and sometimes it doesn't need to be antibiotics that's caused that. Mm. It could just be a bit of corn that's not right or birds pick some up on a Friday and a Saturday in baskets and so on. This mm. just gets rid of it. As we know, a lot of birds are they're sick in a basket and, you're yeah. eating, and your birds are eating somebody yeah. else's and so on. This just cures them out of it. And, it's um, a pond treatment. It's pond tre yeah. And, uh, and, and Antibacterial that's pond treatment. Yeah, and like I said, that's 10 mil to um to a kilogram of corn uh mix it up on the wednesday night because it always wet and, Cush, and so on sure. yeah and um, so that's mixed up on a wednesday night on the yep, floor yeah fed Th thursday morning thursday morning the leak the leak the race mix and so on that's all on i know it's sat in the crop as it always does sits in the yep. crop and if fungal it's cleared that out don't harm the pigeons whatsoever it's um and and that's that and then all my other products that i will use um throughout the the entire season using the comet products and so on and the impact blitz form i use towards the end of the week mm. but as i was saying 
sometimes if we've got a really fast race ahead of us, the weather says, look, it's going to be a, a strong southwest wind. Yeah. Uh, we're not flying very far. They're going to be doing, you know, 17, 1800 yards a minute. You know, for me, I don't need to give them B12. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't need to give them that kind of yeah. stuff at all. So just looking at the weather and uh, using that accordingly. Take me to when the vet, what, when do you get your vet visit in before racing? Then? Yeah, so round about, I book in three weeks before first race. Yeah. And I take a few birds over, maybe sometimes four, but usually just two or three pigeons. I take them over, randomly selected, take them over, take the droppings over there. And again, they do the swaps uh, back end, down the throat. Uh, drop-ins analysis um, and so on and, and they're looking to see if there is anything there mm -hmm. the reason's three weeks it gives a recovery time so I might think the birds look absolutely fabulous and everything's great they might turn around they've got a high or low bacterial infection you need to kind of treat them so I'll take them that point three weeks before usually it's a five-day process mm -hmm. there they have that five-day treatment then you've got a week recovery and you're back onto it there yeah. so for me, the three weeks is sacrosanct, just for them to tell me how we are with everything. Yeah. So we spoke about what you give them at middle end of the week on a Saturday return. Yeah, so on the Saturday, I keep things as um, straightforward as I can. So they'll come home and they'll have a depurative waiting yeah. for them with yeah. the Comodal oil yeah. and with uh, Bayer's recovery, which is yeah. protein. Yeah. So they have this spread on the corn, and uh, it, it, I think it smells lovely, me, to be honest with you, but uh, it's, it's not yeah, like it's a brewer's nice. yeast, but yeah. it, it, it's quite nice. Uh, and so they have that on the corn, and that recovery, and so they'll have that on a Saturday, return from the race, they'll have it on a Sunday, and dependent on if the race has been a bit tricky, they might have that Monday as well, yeah. and so on. So again, practice protein, so just literally, recharging the birds what they've lost and they put into the race you're bringing that in my thoughts are rather than change the corn they've got different texture corn and using beans or peas or, or um, any other kind of product that's like protein i'll leave the same corn but put additives on that yeah so the, the, they've got the same corn they know the 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 GPO, no problem whatsoever but they've got the products you that's the protein them, on, rather yeah. than using generally bigger grain yep yeah. Yeah, using smaller grains That's with right. protein on, yeah, and it digests quicker as well. Absolutely. So, so this is kind of my thought process around it all. Um, the you know, some sometimes uh, I might use something with uh, high energy as well, an high energy yeah. oil maybe because sometimes people think energy is pre thought race, mm -hmm. whereas I often use energy after a race and so on, lifting so them up, them. lifting them up and so on. Yeah. So using an energy oil, Bayer's do a, a, a nice one. Um, and uh, again, put oil on the on the corn and um, uh, put that recovery on there. And I find that turns them around. I think it's massively important that your next week's race starts the second them birds come home. Yeah. So, um, you know, we all like to kind of celebrate them or even on a bad race we might kind of look over why it's not worked but we've got to start preparing them birds because a week's not a lot of time no. before that next race yeah feed wise so depurative yeah you've mentioned beginning of the week we have additives yeah. on in your, in your protein yeah what do we move on to move on to again dependent on the weather i'm, I'm massive on looking at the weather i know in this country we don't always get it right and i don't always get it right but i try and look at what kind of race it's going to be at the weekend and how mm. far i'm flying so if you like uh, your prevailing winds a southwest wind let's say we've got a, a, a very low it's going to be a 1500 day i'm flying at 110 miles hypothetically what i'll probably do is come uh, wednesday afternoon put them onto a race mix yeah. which i'm not really precious about it i've used all sorts of it years as long as it's a lovely clean race mix mm -hmm. a winter wood mix it's usually smaller stuff um you know your versa lagers I, i've used a lot of jerry pussy in the past but i haven't used it for a few years but something that's not got peas in but it's more of um, uh, high carbohydrates uh, with wood mix. So I've gone from the depurative, gone into that on, on let's say the Wednesday, and they will have that then for every feed yeah. leading up to uh, Friday. And if I feel the race needs it, they may then on Thursday night have maybe fats 
and so on may change that widowhood to a, a high fats yeah. and so on. But again, I don't use a lot of fats, I'll be honest with you, but it will all depend upon what that day is going to be like on a Saturday. Because I'm a massive believer in if the birds don't need that extra bit, you can be an hindrance rather yeah. than yeah. A, a positive. Um, birds should be looking for home when they've got too much power inside them and they go sailing over yeah. and so on. Um, so I try and feed according to what I believe the day is going to be. So if it's going to be a little tough, as well as Thursday night feed, yep. would you feed it on Friday morning? Yeah, yeah, pr pretty much, yeah. So what I do is, is that if it's going to be a pretty tough day, um, you know, anything from maybe a, a 1300 day, yeah. maybe let's say, um, um, then I will give some fats on a Friday morning. Um, I'm a big, big believer in the birds have got to go to a race with an empty belly though. Yeah, I, I don't want you. any food inside them whatsoever. So, uh, and I, I, I believe if you basket your birds on Friday and you fed them in the morning, you can feel corn, there's something not right. Mm. That would be my view. Yeah. They need to be completely stripped and, and, and flat, all blown up yeah. and so on. So I would feed them in the morning, early in the morning, let them have a feed. Dependent on the day, it might be a full feed, it might be half a feed. Again, what time in the morning? Well, we're, we're in April onwards now, so yeah, I have yeah. the luxury of being down garden round about between five and a half, five in the morning. <laughs> so uh, on a Friday... Up at half past so, four. Up at half past four, earlier. cup of coffee in my van, down garden. I'm first down there every day. I've got Sky to myself, which is always great for me. Yeah. Um, and then I can... Um, and then, of course, then lads start drip feeding in and their birds coming out. But I've usually done what I need to do when they're lasting at night. So on that Friday, I probably would have fed them. I don't let them out on a Friday, but I would have fed them, I don't know, round about, say, six o'clock, something like yeah. that. They've had that, whatever I'm putting into them. They've had that. It's off them. That's them done. I might, dependent again on the day, give them a little bit of either black rape or maybe yeah. a bit of them when I get down later on, just yeah. so they have a drink. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and hydrate themselves. Last thing then, uh, bath. When do you bath your pigeons? Do you know something? My pigeons must stink as pigeons go because I'm, I'm not a big bather. Okay. I, I, no, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not. And I always bath inside the shed. I never bath outside the shed. And the reasons for that is I don't like my pigeons to be sat around in garden, on yeah. grass, on decking. One, you've got your, your hawks. Well, that's yeah, yeah. one thing, the wet, the, the, the easy target. But for me, I don't let my birds pick around because everything that lays eggs lays at eggs on floor and slugs, snails. I'm on an allotment. There's rats, there's vermin, there's everything all over. Yeah. So when I do bathe, bath time goes in the shed and I use a product called Borox. Yeah. And um, I use that in the water and um, they'll bathe inside the shed and they splash it off all over and I'm fine with that because whatever it kills on the bodies yeah. and helps them, it's also gone all over the floor, in the nuts and crannies and everything. Just literally take the bath back out, dry it all up as you can. And, and that, that, that's I'd it. imagine when you do a bath, then you try and do it on a decent day. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I will do. Yeah. So I would have said, how many times do I bathe? It's hard. I don't. I do. My answer is, I have no routine on 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 bathing at all. That surprises me. With you, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. no yeah. 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 So yeah, the uh, not at all. I think uh, I would say without holding me to it, I bet you if you have three baths. In race time, that it. That's about it. That surprises me with him because it, with everything else, yeah, he's like got to be. I, Chris, I've never ever ever been somebody who thinks that bathing um, mm. is is needed for pigeons. I know mm. back in the day, I was six years old when my dad introduced me to pigeons, and those kind of days routines was you know you'd have your race on a Saturday, Sunday bath would be out on garden or birds. It's time to relax yeah. and chill out and all them things. Um, no, I, I, I've never never seen a benefit of it, yeah. and my results. I, I I don't think I've ever thought, oh, if I bathe them, it's going to be yeah. all all right. I get, yeah, I fully understand. Because Mark's not got Avery's on his old bird racing lot. Yeah. So they'd have to be bathed outside. Which, for me, this day and mm. age, would be a no-no anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why you do it yeah. in loft. Uh, 
But yeah, I thought you'd have been a, no, a Friday morning bear. Then. No, not at all. I have, Chris. I, th th there's been times when I have done it just spontaneously. Hot day, maybe, yeah. and, and so on. And I've thought, oh, yeah, just give them a bath. But it's not something I've, I, I ever kind of build into a routine. They've got to bathe. That's what I say. My pigeons, from a pigeon world, they may, be, they may stink my <laughs> pigeons. Compared. Maybe that's when maybe sometimes they get ahead. I don't know that nobody wants to... Uh, race alongside them, I don't know. But no, I've, I've never been a big advocate to kind of bathe them. And, and again, things you learn over years, there's some good lads who are no longer with us in the, uh, and the timeliness of bathing, I think is also important if you are going to be an eye bather because like I say, I use borax in terms of the water kills that any kind of thing that may be living lice and so on. I don't have lice on the pigeons or anything, but what I would say is is that it's massively important that you don't take out all the natural oils out of your pigeon when it's coming up to a race. Mm. That's another thing. I, I, some, again, if it's true or not, I don't know. It's something that I learnt off, off a few guys. So if you were going to bathe, it'd be yeah, yeah, but if I were doing, it Sunday or whatever. Yeah, possibly. But if I were doing it, you know, I said that when it's been a hot day, I sometimes give them a bath on, yeah. on, on the Friday. Uh, it's just been water. With no else in no it. else in it, mm. just water and so on, and um, uh, and and you know no products to kind of make them all silky and so on. Uh, all my products yeah. make them do that anyway. Yeah. Um, so no, I I, I, I don't necessarily uh, do that, but I do just like I keep saying, do it when it's inside the shed, not outside the shed. And that includes young birds as well. Young birds as well, yeah, young 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 birds. In fact, I know with my young birds this year. Uh, I put a bath in first time they'd had a bath or first time I'd offered them a bath. I went back in afternoon because I left them in it because there's an avian young birds. Yes. I left them back in and then not not one of them had touched water. Honestly, not one of them had been in. I'm thinking, <laughs> you see, they don't want to do it. So yeah. it, 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 it's, it's counter productive sometimes, I think. Uh, once you get them going into that, uh, uh, then of course they will, but uh, that happened. This is why I ask such questions because... There's always something to learn. Every loft I've been to, bathe on a regular basis. And I've, I've asked him about bathing his pigeons, which some people think, what's he asking that for? Mm. That's why, because yeah. you, you, you pick bits up. Yeah. And that's the first, yeah. for me, a, a top fancy. Yeah, but again, I know when um, I put my birds in on a Friday, uh, and I, again, I'm not saying bathing does or doesn't do this, but I like me... I like them to be virtually falling through my fingers yeah. uh, and, and so on. So um, if bathing would improve it, I don't know. It's something I've never, I've never really looked at. Them. <laughs> right, as I said, that's the first. Next section, the all-important motivation. But we'll just touch on ends. That routine, I would imagine, is same for your ends. Yeah, same for my ends. I think sometimes beginning of the year when I don't have a lot of time because I've got my young ones ready, I need them to be out. Yeah, I've yeah. got cocks, I've got hens, I work, I've got a young family, time, lightness and so on. So what I tend to do is is that I probably have cocks out in the morning, ends at night or vice versa. Until daylight. Until daylight. If I don't think me hens or me cocks need to go out twice a day, then I won't let them out twice a day, once a day. And again, I think everybody... Um, will take advice from certain fancies in their life. And, and, and a few years ago, I remember um, Willie and George Macaloni. Um, I once spoke to them, and what they was doing was they let their ends out just once a day. Mm. And, um, and they flew really well once a day, and they were locked up until the following day, and, and so on. And so I do believe you don't have to have them out twice a day, and, and so on. So it helps me out, because if I... At that time of year, if I started to say I've got to have my cocks out twice, my ends out twice, and so on, it just wouldn't. It, I just wouldn't yeah. be able to physically do it. I'd have to choose cocks or ends. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to get both of them. So, um, so one in the morning, one at night. But I will sometimes switch that round a little bit. I don't think it's got to be cocks in the morning. It's got to be ends at night. I may switch that round a little bit, and so on. Before we finish this section. What section, depending on if you have them out morning or evening, at what time of day do you think they fly better? Um, again, when I think they're in the routine, like most people, ends will usually put a, a shift in more than yeah. cocks will. 
so ends will kind of just go go off and uh, and do and usually most of the time they go out on an evening my ends when i say evening it's around about half past four time mm. lads on allotments they've all finished for the day i think i'm only worker on there so they've all been down down all day they've now gone home i've got sky to myself my ends will go out on an evening time if the weather's not good and I know it's not good in the morning and so on. I won't try and put them in it morning at side at Cox or anything. Yeah, yeah. I, they'll, miss, they'll miss a flight. They're yeah. simple as they'll just miss that flight. So I'll put them out at half past four time, five o'clock. Depends what time I get on from work. And then they'll, they'll have their fly at that point. So does that mean your cocks get, not priority, but your cocks are your, a little bit main, main focus than your ends? You, you're, not, you're happy with ends missing a flight? Well, it's, it's vice it's versa. If, if if I got there in the morning and it's it's cold and drizzly or yeah. high winds and, and, and so on, uh, cops had missed the flight yeah. and they'd have to wait until the next day. But in the afternoon I've got there and ends, it's a nice enough day, ends will go out. So I'm not precious about them staying in because I sometimes do believe it's massively important. Rest is the best um, cure for yeah. anything as much as kind of working hard. It's, it's a fine balance, but... But I'm not frightened of just keeping them in shed. I prefer to keep them in shed rather than put them into weather that I just think is not conducive at all. So, which could knock them down. Which could just knock them down as well. And the, the, other, the other thing is, is that two years ago, I think two or three, two years ago, um, I were massively hit the uh, sparrow oaks and peregrines mm. uh, and my birds wouldn't even go out at shed and so on. So in that particular year, um, you know, I, I was having to be a little bit... Um, up and down with my system just yeah. to try and get the birds out at a time when the sparrows would have fed what's mm. going to be the best time for them uh, to, to get out but um, it, it, it can be difficult and I know a lot of fanciers who, who may watch this will have that problem and it is very difficult to manage if you've got a routine but it's the time you need to have that routine because of work or, or family or appointments and it's the time when it's yeah. it's breeding season for uh, bird of prey. It's always difficult to uh, to try and get your pigeons out and uh, motivate them. So we'll move on to motivation. All important. Well, some people believe it is. Others don't think it is. Just think it's good pigeons. But we'll speak about that as well. Right, motivation. We'll speak about motivation. Uh, and there's a few questions that I want to ask about. Uh, products for young birds sickness uh, as well and about treatments so mainly motivation but we will put other bits into it as well so motivation Mark first of all when we talk about racing cocks and ends you don't have stay at home partners no so it's 100% with the wood yeah. dual with the wood What's your motivation from first race to last and does it change at any specific time or is the special things that you do Yeah. Uh, what you think gives your pigeons an extra yard or two? Yeah, I think uh, th there's a variety of different things I'll do which I, I can, can explain with but I think um, for me what, what we need to be is kind of diverse in what we do to motivate a pigeon I mean, first of all you've got to try and understand your pigeons I yeah. think that's that's massively important you should never do anything radical and what I mean by that is change everything and expect a pigeon to understand what's happening and yeah, so yeah. on yeah, yeah. so if you are making changes there need to be slight changes with a view that it's just going to give them an inch rather than trying yeah. to do something so it's important but my basically is uh, probably like a traditional widowed in a sense where um comes to friday um they will uh, i'll put them together the yearlings um sometimes i leave the cock and end together for an hour mm -hmm. free of the loft completely they can tread whatever it is uh a free of the hour uh, the two-year-olds uh, would get uh, less and um, I don't have many three-year-olds. I usually round about being two, yeah. two, because I, I sprinting. I, I, I personally, I think yeah. it's uh, it's about an age thing, but um, the, 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 they'll have probably less time together. So I never set out on a Friday to give them 
a set amount of time. They tell me when I think that that's yeah. right. Yeah. So I'll go into this. I've got three sections, and at the beginning of the year, I try and put um, the new yearling cocks coming in into hopefully their own section realistically. Because I think by mixing them around in one section, and I know a lot of people might watch this, might only have one section, which is nothing you can do with that. But but what I tend to do is is that um, I will bring the ends to the cocks on majority of the time yeah. the cocks will have had the bowls let them play around in the bowls a little bit uh, let the ends in if I let the ends in and I'm only giving them a set amount of time uh, it could be anything from five minutes upwards yeah. it all depends I like to watch the reaction if a cock is driving his end like mad inside the box personally on my pigeons I don't necessarily look for them on a Friday I like to see that everything's nice and calm, they've both gone down into the ball, they're both ready, and, and sometimes I've even seen it where he doesn't even try and tread her, the fact that just the they've just gone in the ball. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that's a good indicator with the majority of my yeah. birds on how they go down. Uh, Time-wise, I've got three sections, so it, it literally, once I've put them all together, um, I'll probably go and feed my young birds, go feed stock birds. Like I say, with my yearlings, I'm at, I'm at beginning of the uh, April, May, maybe beginning of June, they might get start off with an hour, might reduce that down to half an hour, might just reduce it down even more, dependent on how they've been performing. But that would be the traditional putting the end to the cock. Where there's a caveat to that is sometimes women motivation. So if you if when we do when we show people mill off, we've got three sections. The cocks will be in the boxes, usually on V perches outside the box, not in the box in the week. The ends will have their section, and they're, they're just literally uh, we're doing end boxes. What will happen is is that if I want to switch things around, I'll put the ends in the boxes. Yep. and put the cots in the end side yeah but that's something i will probably do around about june time mm. when you're starting to just do things a little bit different a little bit yeah. uh, and so on but ultimately on a friday night the ends go to the cocks they have a period of time together um and then um i will basket either cock or end in the basket and they will go off off to the race and uh, that's how it be so you put all your three sections. You, I was going to ask you, how do you, do you let ends run in it? You, you, I, I take them in. If it, it'd be carnage if yeah. I did that. Do you basket them and yeah. get them out, put them on yeah. the the boxes? To make it easy for me, each section has a colour code, so they'll have a yeah. celluloid ring with a colour code on. Yeah. So what I'll do, I'll go into end section, I'll basket the ends and put them into a basket that is for their section. Yeah. yeah. I then walk down my corridor and uh, box Avery is on the front. I literally put the baskets where the cocks can see them and so on. Section one, two and three, they can see where they want to go. Yeah. Section one, I'll, I'll let the ends go into the cocks, fly, to fly the, to the cocks, yeah. And uh, then section two, do the same, section three, uh, I'll, I'll do again. Again, not necessarily making things sacrosanct, that sometimes if I want uh, the yearlings maybe not to have contact with the end, I may then hand deliver each and yeah. every one and into the box, leaving the cock on the outside. Yeah. So motivation for me is something that um, I, I could spend hours doing different things. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Certain pigeons like certain things. And again, that's what I was saying about understanding your pigeons. But I think in terms of the basics of the uh, hen in the bowl, the cock in the bowl is probably what I do most times. There's other things around motivation, um, and it can be a board that goes from left to right across the nest boxes. Mm -hmm. Put a board up, lets the cocks walk across the boxes. Yeah, there. front, so it can that's right. wind each other up. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Just doing things like that. And some I don't do it a lot of. Is that something you do on Friday? Yeah, that would be a Friday. Uh, again, if I wanted to play around with certain pigeons, it's usually two year olds I would do that, not yeah. necessarily young birds. I think it's massively important for me anyway that we don't get the young birds to a point where they've gone over the top and I think that's massively important that they're not over motivated. I don't like it when I put my cocks in a basket that they're fighting each other desperately. I think when that happens, you, I think you've done something wrong. Yeah. When, yeah, I remember back in the day in the 80s and 90s when we used to, there used to be a, um, a fanciest called Scorer Brothers and their birds used to come up to thing and they were top men around and, and they'd get a cock out and it'd be bleeding 
and the cops would be savaging each yeah. other and I could never understand why you would want a pigeon to go to a race that, that wound up and, yeah. and so on. So I like them to be nice and calm um, and, and uh, when I'm basketing cocks I'm always in a rush to put three birds in a basket because two birds will fight. Yeah. So, put, yeah, I'm, so I'm quickly getting get numbers in. That's to, exactly, yeah, yeah, to calm it down. And then, so each section, I have one, two, three sections, all have, they all go in one basket. So it's yeah. like their family. So a family, a red team, blue team, orange team, they always go in the same basket. They're always in week in, yeah. week out. They only get mixed up with the other ones on when we go to the basketing on a Friday and they get mixed round. Um, does it does it matter? No idea. But it's what I do. And, and, and it works. Well, it has been working, yeah. So it... So that's what you stick to cause yeah, it's, yeah. That, that that's exactly it um and the again in terms of if i feel it's going to be a really really fast race they don't need a lot of time together sometimes with the older birds they might not even need to touch each other mm -hmm. and so on i'll i maybe put the cock in the bowl and put the end on the outside or vice versa or, or whatever yeah. Um, I do read and I do hear about it and I know some, some close friends of mine that might sometimes play around two ends on one cock. I don't have that time really on a Friday to, to start doing all them things. Will it work? I'm sure it'll work in some occasions. Mm -hmm. But I like to keep things as basic as I can because Friday's calmness. And if you ask my wife, anybody phones me on a Friday when I get birds ready, I just completely... You can get ready for an earful. It, oh, it is. <laughs> it, for me, it's massively important yeah. that I shut that shed door, I've gone in there... I'm calm, getting them birds ready. They know, they've already known. Yeah. You've built them up. I believe them pigeons know inside, I feel stronger, I'm all blown up, I've got this energy, I'm feeling good. You know it's Friday. And suddenly, yeah. see me coming down, I walk up, maybe turn bowl over, and here we go. They know, they, they're, they're absolutely buzzing. And the noise, uh, one of the lads in our club, he, he, he came down, which I don't, as you know, have a lot of people at my loft and so on and they come down and the noise that they make it, 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 you can hear yeah. it at the gate at thing they're, they're that motivated and they're, they're, they're all ready i know when i'm doing them things then you you know that your, your pigeons are, are, are kind of the right the the yeah. the motivated um but that is realistically all i will do uh, with the racing cocks and racing ends I found when I do switch the ends round and put the ends, I obviously have to put the ends inside the box and feed them inside the yeah. box because if not, they'll pair up. Pair up in that section. So I'll do that. And uh, I know when I want Northern Classic, that's what I've done with, with yeah. uh, uh, Pigeon I call Millie 20. What I've done with her is, is that the, the uh, put the ends behind the box, fed them in the box and so on. And that week, I'd, I, I believe she was that keen on that box herself yeah. Um, give her the edge and uh, she come one first open for me um, but ultimately most times it's the, the cock I leave in there just going back to when you put the ends in section yeah section red yeah yeah blue and yeah. yellow yeah if you're yearlings yeah you, you try and get all your yearlings in the same section I try yeah because it when yeah, when you mentioned about some of them, you let them out run at loft for an yeah. hour, you'll give them more time. Yeah. Obviously, if you're doing that, if you've only got yeah. one section, it'll upset your other pigeons who are locked in. So your first, your yearly section will be the one that you put them in, yeah. and you'll go probably go and concentrate on, on your those, others, yeah. your so older pigeons. Sometimes I'll I'll put them in first. Now the problem when people say it's a problem, the problem people might think is is that they can hear them others they're all paired up and suddenly this cock in here in this section that seen his end is not i think it makes no difference yeah. to them my pigeons and any pigeons in the loft in the matter if it's 50 foot long 10 foot long whatever they can hear each other yeah. they know they're each other they play a radio in loft some people have a radio to try and do you know something chris i start i started to do that my wife bought me one last christmas and uh, it it, it I, I literally put it on in the morning and afternoon come batteries were dead and it's never been on since <laughs> so so I, I, I've done seen some lads because there's no lucky on the gardens or all like that but I've seen some lads have a radio on and, and, and possibly and if I had lucky on they would have it on probably but I don't know if it would be a benefit or not I don't know yeah it's about I've never yeah but what I tend to do is is that you're right with the yearlings I try and get them all in, into uh, one section as much as I can so one section is and they're the ones that'll have more time. I find it calms them down. 
it just it just brings that it's a bit like testosterone in young lads when you see them yeah, all yeah. had a few pints and yeah. so on they're a bit leery and so on i try and just calm them down a little bit the other thing i will often do with, with when i'm pairing up with yearlings i try and pair them to an older end yeah, yeah and yeah, vice versa yeah. around so that that it helps. Uh, that old process it ends no the game calmness yeah. on a friday for me is sacrosanct it's got to be it's got to be pleasant it's got to be calm and the same as then um, you know, I, I know before I changed my career, I was rushing like mad on a Friday. In fact, sometimes I went into literally not showing the partner on a Friday because I didn't have time and go in. But I find if you're rushing in there, just grabbing cock all in and putting them in, it's like, what, what, what's happening? Yeah. So just keep everything nice and calm, take your time with it all and, and, and start. Once you've got the birds all basketed up, each section, I take them, put them straight into the back of my van, cover them over. And, uh, and and vice versa, each section keep doing it in until they're all in back at van. As soon as they're all in back at van, they're all on. Drinkers go on, off to club we go. Mm. Right, so that's with old birds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Again, sounds very basic, but it clearly works. And when you've got good pigeons, yeah, I think love of home is just as important certainly love of that box it's not all about the end yeah it, it's the box i think it's everything chris you know like what you just said there it's spot on again no evidence to say this is right but i think if you've got an happy home for pigeons they're they're, they're going to race home they're happy and there's so many contributing factors to keep them happy yeah. in so on it doesn't matter if you've got chickens at side of them all that so they get used to that they're happy they know they're all right so if like for me on allotments, sometimes we've had uh, mink and so on that's yeah, knocking yeah. about and so on. Even though that's not come to escape, pigeons, if it's unsettled them, they're not focusing on what they need to yeah. be. So keeping it, keeping it as, as much as you physically can, keeping things all nice and calm uh, around everything, then pigeons know that they're, they're happy. If things change, they know things aren't right. And I think that's when your racing can be sporadic in that sense. This might sound strange to some people, uh, but I'm going to ask Mark, when you're in your loft, particularly young birds, but old birds as well, I've been in lofts where people, they move around quick, they're sharp, and they don't seem to have any concept of moving like that in your loft unnerves your pigeons. <laughs> I'm guessing yeah. when you're in your widow a cock section, yeah. end section, and young birds, you move slow, you purposely yeah. turn, if you're close to them, yeah. you're slow in your movement because you want that calmness, you yeah. don't want them to be scared of you. Um, it's, 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 it's like a kid's bedroom, it's supposed to be a safe place and, and, and everything. That, and, and, yeah. and, so when I'm in my loft, and again, I don't know if this works or doesn't work, because uh, I've known some kind of guys who are kind of loud, brash and erratic and use sticks and all sorts and do very well with it. Me personally, I'm calm. Even if somebody comes to me allotments and shouts me, and my loft's 50 odd foot long, I literally walk out before I've answered them. They've probably yeah. shouted me three or four times, but I yeah. won't shout back in there. And that's how I am with it. And, uh, and that's why on a Friday, my phone, it'll stay in where at my seating area. I won't answer my phone uh, because I, I don't want uh, things being disturbed. Yeah. I don't know if it works, it's just me. Do you lock your gate now as well? I have been doing recent work. <laughs> I, think, I think what happens is, on our allotment, I'm certain there were one or two people deliberately kind of come to visit me yeah. just to kind of upset the apple cart. So a nice, yeah. uh, a nice lock on the lock gate kind of just, just changes it. It probably doesn't work at all, but if I feel better, because I do believe in a lot of things, it's about psychology. If yeah. I feel it works, then I'll continue yeah. to do it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so on. So... Um, do you spend much time? Do you spend much time with your young birds? We we'll just touch on yeah. this, but before we go into young bird racing, yeah. Do you? I would imagine. Mm. Uh, I know time is yeah. of the essence we work in. Yeah. But I, I'd imagine you don't spend too much time with pigeons. Mm. But do you feel it's important that you spend a little bit of time with them to create that calmness and yeah. they're not scared of you? Yeah. 
I wouldn't say my young birds. I'm not the kind of guy who, when I watch these people and young birds are sat all over their heads and they're eating out their mouths and their hands and so on. My birds have never been that, probably because I don't have that time with yeah. them to do that and so on. I think how I see my young birds is I'm there for a reason for them young birds. Yeah. It's usually associated with food. Mm. Okay, so when I'm around, they know they're flying or they're in the shed and there's food at the end of it and everything. So that's how they associate me. So I have a whistle. I always, I always train to whistle and so yeah. on. So everything I do, I whistle and, uh, and, and so on. And, um, and so I have corn on me all the time so they, they, can, they can hear that. And the whistle on all the time, and I will throw a little bit of food occasionally around, so they they, they get to know me and food, and then so yeah. on. But I don't spend hours sitting in them, satting with them, and letting them walk all over me, and and, and all them things. When I basket on a, a a Friday or even for training and so on, my, my birds, I'm not chasing them all over the shed. They, they are pretty good. They'll they'll yeah. be there, and I'll just walk them, pick them up because they get used to it. And like everybody's pigeons. First few times they go in a basket, of course they're frightened and they're a bit unnervy, but um, I don't have massively scary pigeons in terms of me young young birds. Um, but um, but but on, on the other hand, uh, they're not wild. I can go into my shed. They're not like bouncing from ceiling yeah. to ceiling. Yeah, I know Mark could give me that answer, uh, and I think it's important. And you'd be amazed how many people don't move slowly in the loft, they shout and they grab and the way they handle pigeons, mm. uh, it goes through me. Yeah. And it's, all, it all, it's all part of that little jigsaw yeah. for them to be calm and yeah. have a connection with fancier. But yeah. we'll move on to young birds yeah. uh, and we'll speak about the motivation for them. Yeah. And I want to ask some more in-depth questions about young bird sickness as well yeah. so that's the next one mm -hmm. right we're moving on to young birds now uh, which i'm going to grill mark about this obviously i only raise young birds at, at the moment and probably until i retire due to time uh, very successful as he is with old birds he is with young birds as well uh, i know he's very methodic particularly when it's training as it's touched on but with young birds as well we've spoke about young birds being weaned off from his race birds and i would imagine the young birds from stock which are paired up earlier just get put into the young bird section fend for themselves and, and very quickly learn how to live and survive and drink and eat so young birds, Mark, they jabbed in nests, 10 to 12 yeah. days old, yeah. Paramixo mm -hmm. and PHA from Torosan, yeah. which is Paramixo, Herpes Adeno. and Adeno. Yeah. Do you use the circovirus vaccine as well that they do, which is Paramixo, Circo and another one, I forget what they call it now. Not from, not, not from uh, uh, Vetch Road, no, I don't. Um, I, I have, um, it, it, a few years ago, um, uh, a friend of mine uh, got some vaccines that, that came over uh, from Belgium and, um, and he was saying, look, this has got A, B and C. And what I found with a lot of the vaccines is, I've never had it where it shows a benefit in terms of um, using one vaccine over another vaccine. I've always found that a vaccine's a vaccine and that, that's good. But the one I do believe in is just, for me, the most important one is herpes, because I do believe yeah. the herpes is a significant contributor to the problems we have with our young birds yeah. uh, and so on. So the herpes is, is, as long as it's got herpes in it, and, uh, and I guess if somebody came to me today and said, Mark, I've got this from Poland and so on, I probably would try it. I wouldn't just say, no, I, I'm going to use these other ones. The other ones are more available, so that's why I've always used them. But, um, but no, the, the ones that I've said I use is the ones that I primarily use. But in the past, I have used odd bits and pieces that uh, people have given me. Um, mm. But I, I don't see there's a benefit or a, a detriment to it because I think there's other things that contribute to why certain vaccines will work. And the other thing I do is, is that my young birds in the year of the birth will be vaccinated twice 
for everything. So uh, do they need it? I have no idea, but I feel better knowing that they are fully vaccinated uh, uh, and, uh, and have an immunity against some of it because I do think there's a lot of people uh, that don't vaccine, vaccinate for their own reasons as, uh, and so on. Me personally, I do vaccinate because it makes me feel as if they are protected. Give us that cycle then. If they're vaccinated twice for everything. Yeah. So 10 and 12 days in nest. Yeah. Just go over it again. Yeah. It's a Columbavac or a uh, no Novelist. Yep. Yeah. Which are the ones... People think, oh, you're talking about stuff that you're not supposed to use in this... We're not. You can use anything you want. It's not a drug. As long as you're vaccinated with the ones what are in this country, what our PRA advises, which it does do. So they get vaccinated, come back or Novelis, yeah, yeah. and then they get the three in one, yeah. Paramix or Herpes or Dino, yeah. at 10, 12 days old. Yeah. When is the second? Just before I start training. So usually I start training my young birds round about in June time. Yeah. So it uh, could be end of May, but usually round about June time. I'll vaccinate the birds, and again, what I'll do the same as I will with old birds, but a little bit sooner. Before I start training them, I go to the vet. Yeah. I go to the vet, take my young birds, tell them what program I've been doing in terms of they've been vaccinated for this, and this is where we're at. Check my birds out if there's any medication that's needed and so on. If everything's all good and I don't need to uh, medicate for any, any other reason and so on, I vaccinate them at least two weeks, at least two yeah. weeks before I start training. With same ones? With same ones again. Exactly the same yeah, exactly as same. when they tend to exactly. go out. They probably don't need it, I'm probably overdoing it. But the reason why I think is, is that with young birds, so much now than it has been forever, so many young bird losses, and uh, for, for a variety of different reasons, bird of prey being a, a, a significant one. If I ever smash, I want to know my birds, while they're out there, have got as much immunity, immunity as the to, to, as, uh, to, to the, yeah. them and going other people's lofts, bring the bird back and all the things again so this is why I do it before I go training I know some lads and that and they'll say oh you know two weeks before the first race they're going to start vaccinating but they've been training for weeks that's mm. their prerogative mm. me personally I want to make certain when the birds go out there they've got everything yeah. uh, and that's how I do it it's costly but it's what I, I I feel I need to do. No, I agree. They need they need that immunity, and as I say, these vaccines they're not performance enhancing. It's a vaccine for immunity. Uh, so let's get that straight. I know some yeah. people have had it before. Some people oh, you should be talking about X, Y, and Z. No, he's vaccinating with the ones recommended in this yeah. country, but he's also adding the immunity, and it's not performance enhancing at all no. uh, so we've gone from weaning yeah jabbed in nest yeah when when you wean them off do you let them get a bit of age on them before you let them out or do you try and get them out walking up landing bearing in mind we spoke about sparrow yeah 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 what's so your process the, the, this for me is squeaky bum time. I, yeah. I, I absolutely hate that time of year when you know you've got to start getting them out and they're vulnerable. Yeah. They're all vulnerable and they're out there and I'm sat there and waiting and, and, and so on, just literally hoping that we've been lucky. And touch wood, it's not, not been too bad. Um, but um, And as everybody knows, one hawk it can just kind of decimate your season completely. Yeah. Uh, but it's that fear as well. So, so yeah, so I, I start to do it as early as I physically can, get the birds out uh, before they start flying, so they're walking onto the landing. Again, I'm stood around them, I've got my whistle, they know there's a little bit of seed, a little bit of food and so on, so they're associating me, again, with food outside as much yeah. as inside yeah. and so on. And, um, and then I will leave it to their natural kind of instincts then to start seeing when they're starting to go off and yeah. uh, and, and, and do that. Um, I use darkness. I don't... I usually have two teams. Uh, this year's been different. Last year, I had a natural team, which they were never on darkness, and the darkness team. And uh, and after they'd finished the darkness, I put them all together. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, but... 
in, in regards to um, this year, the uh, two teams, both on darkness, um, and then I'll, I'll separate them. We'll come on to motivation with that with that side of things. Um, but yeah, just getting them out at shed as soon as you can. Open and praying we're not going to get it, and and get them into the sky. And again, them first few weeks starting to fly, starting to kit up. Again, it's squeaky bum time for everybody in this country. So it's not just around me. Um, and once we start to see them batching um, and going out, I think at the point when I can open my bobs and the birds go straight out, they go up into the sky and they've gone, that's when I start to think, right, I've gone to this stage. That's, that's a, taking a breath of fresh air and you say, thank God I've gone there because it's hard work getting them to that stage. But they're away from Sparrow then. Sparrow's usually finished. I've got my peregrines and then. Watching, yeah. yeah, so the peregrines, so I've been it more times, uh, a bit peregrines. Um, this year's no different than rest. I've had peregrines just literally just go straight in, uh, pick one out, um, and then you, you regather in it. And what I've learned over the years, because it happens every single year, uh, I've made huge mistakes in the past by keeping the birds in. Uh, because they've been it be a sparrow, they've been it be a peregrine, gossok, keeping them in. For me, that's the worst thing we can do. The old saying, you fall off your bike, you need to get back on it as soon as possible. Like and, 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 and doing it, by keeping them in, you're building that anxiety. Unfortunately, our birds have got to get used to, because they're not going away, the peregrines, the sparrows and so on, they're not. So I think when they've had an orc, orc attack, sensibly the next day, I'll try and get them out. In their own time they're not going to be jumping up and scared they're a bit nervous they come out but get them out and hopefully you have a good day they go back in they know they're yeah. safe it's been a one-off uh, i have had it where they've been it on second day and sometimes on third day yeah. and you know it's really difficult to get them going but when they've had an orc attack it's important for me that we get back on it and so on they've got to learn to live with the dangers that's in the sky the more you hide them away from it for me the more nervous they become and therefore the, the mind's not on racing. Yeah, no, I agree. <clears throat> it's just so difficult and it is squeaky. It's heart-wrenching. It's Everybody heart -wrenching, Chris. hates it. It's yeah. Oh, more, worst time in pigeon racing yeah. is that time of year when you're getting babies out. Yeah. Uh, so when they're batching and they start ranging, uh, this year my young birds didn't really range. Not for more than 10 minutes anyway. But mm. what time... I know you said you start training in June, yeah, which is about you start early, a month before or six weeks. Yeah, before, yeah it's, about, it's about a month to six weeks before first race. Um, I'll, uh, I'll 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 look at it. Like I said, I've already took them to vets a couple of weeks before that. Make sure everything's yeah. okay. They're already vaccinated up. It's a nice day. I'm going to start training. Right. So you start training just to just for uh, an example. Yeah. You start training, you start winning basket, they're still ranging at this point, flying well. Mm -hmm. I'll go on to sickness first. My next, my next thing we're going to be, do you, when you start training, do you just train or just try and keep them flying and, and train as well? But as soon as you get a bit of stress, the training, first jump for everybody, more often than not, again, squeaky bum time yeah. for the first half a dozen times. Yeah until they've got it and they know it. But you start training to get a bit of stress. Let's say they've had a smash, they're coming back in ones and twos for hours on end. Next couple of days, droppings go off. Yeah. Pigeons aren't looking right. There's no, no noise in loft. Cocks are quiet, young cocks. What do you do then? Because we all know that is the start of yeah. the problems. So, I think... The clear when people talk about young bird sickness, for me, it's mutated itself over the last 15 years in many, many different ways. Yeah, yeah. And you get different levels, and I think we all might call it young bird sickness, but it not necessarily will be young yeah, bird yeah. sickness. So we may uh, associate young bird sickness to vomiting being on perches, droppings, so the digestive system is not working right, the droppings becoming off, and so on. So if we utilize that as the kind of the catalyst of young bird sickness. So when things start to happen, I think the first indicator for me is feeding. Yeah. So straight away, I'll put food down. It won't be like dush and they're all eating. They're a bit right. They're the picking yeah. and so on. I know there's something not right. So uh, what I tend to do, I've, I've um, 
I don't often suffer with what people call a jungle sickness. I think I had it this year, if you want to call it that, for maybe 48 hours, maybe 72 hours, maybe maximum. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm using young, but I don't think a young bird sickness is not a disease. No. There's a, there's a name for diseases yeah. and they get a, they get yeah. an illness. Yeah. It's just a generic term everybody seems to say. Yeah. But it, but it in there's, yeah. there's an illness. Yeah. So so I think it's it's it, as we all know it's the secondary kind of stuff that that actually brings in that yeah. creates more of a problem. But at that first stage to answer your question, what I do at that point I notice them is there's two products I, I've used and I've used them for a few years and for me to high success. And yeah. they're a vet Schroeder stuff. Yeah. It's the uh, bacteria mega oil yeah. and the um, I mean, the tolicin uh, uh, for it. Yeah. So um, this is 15 mil to uh, a kilogram of corn. I put that on the corn. Um, and when I first got put onto this, I'm thinking, well, my birds are not eating. So how am I going to get this into them if they're not eating? Yeah. But they're trying to do peck about with it and so on. I've used that and that. Um, literally, within a few days, I've always, if it's been low level, they've been absolutely fine there afterwards. Just you mix it up night before just that on the corn. Well, well, what I, t I tend to do is is that when I use this, uh, it makes the wall, uh, the corn all sticky and so on. Yeah. So pigeons eat food that's dry, realistically. Yeah, yeah. So putting an oil on it, they're, they're, and they're not eating anyway, they're just going to be kicking it about and so on. So what I tend to do is is that I, if I put that on first and that dries quite so then break it back up because it all sticks together and it's all dry. Yeah. Put this oil on, then it keeps it all, all soft and so on. And then what I'll do is, is that I'll probably put the recovery on there yeah. because that's got additives in there to help the, the yeah. gut lining and so on. So, so that's on the feed yeah. till it dries. Yeah. That on the feed and, yeah. and, and, and that as well. And that on. Because that, put with that, that dries it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it has its own, own spoon in there. And then uh, you leave it overnight? Yeah, 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 yeah. pretty pretty much. So it yeah, has yeah. that. So I put that into a kilogram of corn, let it all dry off and so on, and, and give it to the pigeons. And I found that that has, has worked successfully. However, there is, there is a, a, a caveat to that. When my birds have not responded to that, mm. and the drop-ins then still remain to be extremely um, uh, green and yeah. loose and, and so on. Uh, if I thought it's going to go into, and I've gone in and there's been, again, not a lot, but little bits of corn about and so on, what I've done is, and there's only ever two times I ever treat blind now. Yeah. Back in the day, like a lot of pigeon lads, I would always like looking what I got, what can do this, and just hope and pray that that were going to work. I don't do that. That's why I've been saying about the vets. What I do is there's two things I don't. I, I, sorry, I, I blind treat with with the young bird sickness. If that is not working and they're, they're getting a little bit worse with secondary infection, yeah. I use uh, moxicillin yeah. and ridazole together, and. Uh, the reason why I put them together, the result a lot of, again in my opinion, a lot of young birds who start breaking down when the virus is, is, is there, the canker count starts to lift right up. And I think when a bird's canker count, its body is struggling with the canker that much, everything else is, is getting on, then you're going to start getting your E. coli and all yeah. the things that come through it. So I found the two products mixed together, amoxicillin and ridazole, and I would add advocate that when people say ridazole don't use a product that's got ridazole in it um you know 10 percent ridazole and something else and something else and something else yeah. it needs to be just ridazole yeah. and again in terms of um using amoxicillin they'll go on that if i have to do that with my pigeons they've got to stay in mm. not because of spreading and so on they're not very well if your kid were poorly you'd won't send them to school mm. to keep them in let them regain themselves and so on. And, uh, and, and then again, I would probably do a full term treatment on that. So I'm talking five days. Mm -hmm. And the reason for five days is, again, if we go to doctors, Chris, very rarely would they ever give you an antibiotic that's not five days long. There's a reason for that. There's always a course. And it always says on, on the bottle or the box, yes. yeah. finish yes, the entire finish the course. course. So, so it's important that for me, you, you, you follow that, you, you've done that, and in my experience, 
I've never had them um, when people said, oh, they've died and stuff. I've never had anything like that. Uh, is that because I vaccinate against therapies, I vaccinate against, mm. you know, all the stuff. So, so is that the reason why? Perhaps I have no idea. But I do have them when they, they go off a little bit. Stress brings that on. But I find once I've had it, um, I don't really get it again. I know I've read lots of things recently, last year and so on, people having it in the yearlings and their old birds and, and so on. Um, I, I can't answer that because I, 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 I've not had that. But those two systems, so that's one reason I would treat blind uh, at that point. And the other time I would only ever treat blind, young birds and old birds. Uh, again, I've mentioned them a few times. Willie McElhoney once said to me, uh, whenever it's a headwind, you must treat them for head cold. Yeah. And the two products I will use, I won't, I won't use them continuously um, when we've, we've had headwinds. I'll either use Linkospectin as one uh, or Doxy T as another and so on. And if we've had a few hard days and um, north winds and northeast wind and so on, um, and I've used Linkospectin, I will also use um, Doxy T the following time. So the, 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 it, it keeps that kind of immunity, I think, than getting used to one kind of product. This year alone, and again, when we go to Milof, I'll show you, I've not even opened Linkospectin this year. It's just been there. I've not had to use it. We've had Edwins. I've used Doxy T. I think we've had Edwins a couple of times, possibly, but I've, I've used Doxy T, and uh, that's been absolutely fine. But they're the only times I would ever treat blind uh, in this day and age. Right, so that's obviously that treatment is mainly the northeast winds. Yep. North winds. Yep. Uh, a respiratory product. Yep. Linko. Yep. Or Doxy T. Yep. Is given for that. That's the only time, as he says, they'll blind treat. Uh, just going off on a tangent, how many times a year do you have a vet visit? Yeah, so this 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 year uh, seven, seven times a year. Yeah, seven this year, and um, there's been two, as I said, one prior to um, old birds. Yeah. One prior to young birds. Yeah. So they've just been like take me birds for routine checks. Is everything's okay? Um, and I like say I've had pigeons. My dad introduced me when I was six. I'm coming up to fifty six now, so I've had them for a long time, on and off in my life, and I'm still learning today. And one of the things. I can't tell you is the pigeon might look great, the droppings are great, everything's good, mm. but something's not right inside. Mm. And uh, and then the drop in, the, the, when, when they drop from a flight, they don't look right and so on. So I don't blind treat, take them to vet. So seven times. And this year alone, other than those two kind of precautionary kind of checks and so on, yeah. uh, five of the other times they've found that there has been a low level bacteria within them. Um, and five times I've been prescribed antibiotics as a, a cure for them and subsequently either four or five times of those times when I've been done I've topped the fed the week after. So And that's I'll give them a little plug, that's uh, Laura and Laura and Dan at Sandhill at Sand at Thirsk, yeah. At Thirsk. Yeah. Laura's been to Marloft as well and I must admit I was very surprised how knowledgeable she was. Yeah. Extremely knowledgeable. So that's sandal vets that Mark uses. So some people get it after the first race, don't they? Sickness. Yeah. So what we've just said, at any stage, what you get it, that's what Mark does. Uh, so training wise, yeah. when do we start? Well, yeah. we know when we start, but how far do you take them? <laughs> well, <laughs> go on, go on. To, to, be, to be honest with you, this year, I, I, I pushed the boat out and it were around about half a mile. <laughs> and I got hit by a peregrine and I lost 20 odd young birds that day. And that was the that exact same, same morning day as I you. lost 30 odd. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so it was it were just one of them things really. Uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't have been avoided really. It was just what, so unlucky and so on. But usually I, I, I go half a mile to a mile, first chuck. Um, and literally, it's just A to B. It's all I want to do. Yeah. I just get them out that basket and home. And where my pigeon loft is, there's a, um, a bus depot just further up, and yeah. um, it's probably not even half a mile. 
and taking them just to come out of that literally as they've stretched the wings they're over my shed virtually yeah. and, and so on so it's just getting them used to that because I think that stress level that you've talked about in terms of creating a young bird sickness or, or other kind of ailments is that I think once you get them used to that uh, that basket things start to calm down and once they know they're going out and, and you can see them and then you just push them on a little bit uh, some people do a basket trading, which I think is probably good uh, that they would do that. I don't have the time, unfortunately, or don't think I have the time. Uh, but on the outside of my shed where the birds trap, I put a basket on, the same baskets they're trained yeah. in, outside, and the drinkers on. So yeah. they can walk in and out of that all the time. So they're not, they're not afraid of what a basket is. They've seen it, they've been walking in them for, yeah. since they could fly up to the box perch. So they're used to that. But literally half a mile to a mile, maximum first chuck. What would you say? <laughs> I, I I always have this conversation with Pat as well because Pat and him are the same. Yeah. You, you know, Mark's good friends with Pat, and he'll go like down to Hillsborough, near Hillsborough football ground, Sheffield Wednesday ground, which is less than half a mile mm. from his loft, and Pat will go there like twelve times. Yeah. And. Mainly for time for me, but also because my brother, I used to race with my brother. Uh, you've not met my brother yet, but if he'd got the time, he would be a top fancy. He's, he has forgot more than I know, and I've not done bad myself, but he's a very intelligent kid. And he plays hell with me. If I take my young'uns, like I did this year, same morning as Mark took his and lost 20, 20-odd 20 with Peregrine, mine were out exercising and they were flying well. Uh, and I turned me, turned me back, looked back, and they disappeared. And I lost thirty odd pigeons that morning. Don't know why. They, they were flying well, but after that, I took them for the first chuck. I think it was five, five or six mile first chuck. Pat would say, "Oh no, no, no!" And, and Mark was half a mile, mm. and and my brother goes absolutely spare with me. What are you pissing about for? going five mile, take them straight to Blythe, which is 13 and a half miles to yeah, me, yeah. take them straight there, stop pissing about, and you'll find they come better. What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> With what you do, because you, it works for you, yeah. what would you say to people who do do that? And like I said, not everything that I will do will suit other people or just because yeah, I do it, make it right. It, yeah, it most certainly doesn't. I know years and years ago, um, we all used to train as first young birds a lot further on. Um, <clears throat> my theory is this. The shorter you take them, they've got shorter space to recover. Yeah. So if that day when I took mine half a mile this year and I lost 20 odd pigeons, mm. if I took them to 13 miles, would I have had it? Well, probably not because it's a different peregrine. Yeah. But if I would have been done at 13 miles and I ended up getting 60 odd birds back, mm. would I have not got 60 odd birds back because mm. they're 13 miles away, they've never been that far before. So it's, it's one of them kind of the um, uh, should I or shunt I. I believe in nurture. My, my, yeah. my old view is, is nurture. Probably too much, probably, sometimes. But I think confidence is a massive thing in life, as it is with pigeons yeah. and any kind of animal. If something or somebody feels confident in what they're doing and so on, they've got more chance of achieving. Yeah. So in my head, taking them on a shorter, not 13 mile, and then coming from A to B successfully in that time, I feel more confident that when I do take them 13 mile, yeah. they've already they done care. it. Because I don't think the distance is the issue. It's the confidence from A to B. That's the, that's the thing for me. So, um, so, yeah, if your brother says to me, yeah, you're messing about and so on, I'd be like, yeah, no problem at all. And I'd still go up <laughs> yeah. one mile. Oh, it was mad. But I must say, though, <laughs> after, after I've done enough at the one mile and they're all right, yeah. I take them to five. So that's a massive yeah. jump from one. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I take them to five mile and uh, they'll stay there for a good period of time. And I think in this, I must say to people, a lot of people don't believe me when I say, the time I've got to um, Clumber Park, which we talked about earlier on, 19, 20 miles, if in total I've had 10 or 12 chucks, mm. that's a lot for me. Yeah. Um, 
they don't go past that. They don't go past that at all, uh, and so on. And I think this year, I'd have to look in my book, but I think this year, before first Young Bird race, including them short mm -hmm. half a mile chucks, I think I'd had something like 16 chucks, that's all, for, mm -hmm. before first race. And that's including the little one? And that's including everything. Every so, so the first time they go in a basket and liberated, that's one training chuck. Mm -hmm. The last time they go there... Once I got them to Plumber Park and I let them go and they didn't do that, they just did that. Yeah. It, for me, it didn't matter where I took them and, and I can keep yeah. taking them. I prefer to just fly them around shed and let them keep flying the way that they were flying yeah. because, the, you know, sometimes time on the wing is, the, is good for young birds and so on. But within them chucks as well, I had um, smashers, the, the, the mm -hmm. trainers and so on. They used to come on in ones, in twos. It's the best education they could have got. Yeah. It's just crap for me, sat there, miserable, yeah. birds missing. But once, after that first chunk, when I got here at Peregrine and lost 20-some, them, all them pigeons after that, um, I don't think I really lost another pigeon training. Um, they, 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 they literally did, did uh, brilliant. Yeah. I agree, I think when we have a smash, it's nerve-wracking. And Terry comes out at Pram and you think, oh, yeah. you know, Jesus Christ. But if you, if you get them all, it's the best thing that can happen. Yeah. Uh, so from there, racing starts. Yep. How often do you go training then? So in my races, so we have like a nine-week training programme with young birds. So yep. the first... Two races. Nine weeks racing. Nine weeks yeah. racing. So from first young bird to last young bird. I think yeah. it's nine weeks, eight weeks, yeah, nine yeah. weeks, something like that. And um, and so on. So the, the, the first race, I think we fly at um, Melton Mowbray, which is about 50 some miles into. 56 to me. Yeah, yeah. So so 56 miles, we'll, we'll start off um, and all my birds will be together. Cox and ends, they're yeah, all together. Yeah. I've got two sections of young still birds. Together, they're all together. Years. Some of them's paired up, some's on eggs because of the times. That the, whatever they want to do, completely, whatever. Get that second race out, but this year the third race out yeah. of the way, and I split them off. Mm. Cox in one side, ends in the other side. I stopped training at that point. My birds exercise, and, and so I never took them training again. So up until that third race, when you park them off and put them on Widowood, yeah, uh, which is Widowood, people say slide in, right? Yeah. It's Widowood because they yeah. parted off. Yeah. Uh, do you train yeah. midweek up until that point? Up until that point, yeah, they continued. Until I got to that third, to second or third race, dependent on the reason why the third this this time, we'd had a bit of an icky race. That I think, I don't know if they did back end up north combine they're all gone down side and I wanted to build the confidence up yeah. so just continue to do that um, and so on so what we did is is that I would train probably Tuesday Wednesday maybe Thursday mm. um, all together down to Columbia Park up and and do, and do that um, and that's what they would get right up until uh, Thursday um, but, but if, I, if I only took them twice, that'd be all right. Yeah. Be, I, w I wouldn't have been bothered about yeah. three. It's only because the weather were all right and I was just in the routine, getting the morning basket taken. Yeah. I used to I, I used to go a bit further, but while I were at that spot, I used to think, I used to see Mark, I used to think, Jesus Christ, what time do you get up in the morning? Yeah. Because I'd be up at half four. Yeah. I would basket my birds in my back garden. Yeah. And then I'd be on my way. And while I'm sat there, I see his van roll up with a big pigeon on the side. And yeah. I, thought, I thought, Jesus, he's got to go to an allotment. <laughs> but and then I think the thing is, when people say fanatic, I, 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 I probably have a little bit. So when I'm motivating, my head's in pigeon season, which it, it, it is, yeah. I'm completely motivated. I'm like, um, I'm programmed. But I get up in the morning, I don't really sleep very well because I'm always thinking pigeons, to be honest yeah. with you. I get up in the morning and often I go to allotment, it's dark. I get there, get my baskets out ready. Sometimes basket birds in dark go down training. It's all nice and light and so on. Um, do I need to do it that early? I've always been in it. From when I used to have my last career, I had to be at work. I used to leave, depending on where I was working in country. I used to work at half seven, eight o'clock. So yeah. whatever I did, I had to do it in that small window. Yeah. So I've kind of stuck at that kind of, I've got to be up early and, uh, and do my birds early. I don't need to be. I mean, but anybody... If you've got a routine and you get up at nine o'clock, I don't think it makes any difference. 
it's just my routine and what I'm used to. So I do it nice and early, get down there and so on. Because then birds are home and done and dusted before the rest of the lads have come onto allotment and all their birds are yeah, flying around. To be fair, that's why I do it as well. Yeah. I think skies are... These days a lot of people get up at that time, but yeah. there's a lot less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you part them off. Yep. Ends in one side, cocks in the other. Yep. And then they just flown round home. Yeah. Will you ever take them training if you think they need need it to liven them back up? Or yeah. if, if I thought they did, Chris, most certainly. Uh, but mine didn't need that. The exercise all. as well. When yeah, the exercise. Them. More so ends than cocks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so on. Ends used to let out in the morning and um, I didn't see them for 30, 40 minutes and then they might come back over and, uh, and, and so on. Cocks. They never really went out of sight. I could always see them wherever they were. Yeah. And on my allotments, you've got fields all around. So there were loads of places. They're not as if it's a built-up area yeah. or anything like that. They can just fly around and so on. Um, uh, I, will f I will put flag up as well and so on. I think the thing with flagging, there's two different kinds of flagging. A pigeon's natural instinct is to fly. If a pigeon yeah. doesn't want to fly, you either... It's because... Like with a lot of my oldens, that motivated the one to get inside the, the shed, shed. And, and you've got to understand that that's what that is. Others, sometimes they don't want to fly, they're not healthy. Mm -hmm. And it takes a skill to try and understand which one that is, um, and, and so on. So I think, for me, when birds, particularly, I'm not going back onto Widward, but sometimes when I know some of the pigeons have not wanted to fly, and they've wanted to come down, yeah. it's because... The, the ready, the, the, the ready. But with me, young, with me youngsters, cocks would do, and again, some people think cocks might do 25 minutes maximum, ends 40 minutes maybe, and so on. But some, some days, I don't know, they did a lot less, and it didn't bother me. But if I thought they'd become flat and I needed to take them down the road, then so be it, I, I would have done. I hadn't had to do the, this year. Yeah. Right, but, um, I think you're spot on with that knowing difference. Yeah. Uh, my old pal, who now is in Donnyfed, who lives at Crowell, uh, in a plum position, Andy, mm -hmm. 16 and a half mile into east. Yeah. Uh, but we'll not say too much about that. Yeah. <laughs> when he was at Woodhouse in Sheffield, he always used to be saying, and, and he, knows, he, he knows he did, he always used to be saying, I can't get the pigeons to fly. They're not flying. And I, occasionally I'd be down there, I'd go down for a few... Uh, pints with him and we'd sit and he'd have birds out and I'm not kidding he'd put flags up balloons up one of these big blowy things with uh, and they only a little garden and they'd just dive down in between them yeah. and they used to be going mad but on Saturday he went hammering them and I said it's just cause, there's nothing wrong with it just because the love of that loft and mm -hmm. it were a good little loft he had it were fantastic Yeah. and it doesn't matter what he had up no. they'd fly through a brick wall to get in we're all birds this year. I remember one particular race, Chris, and uh, a mate of mine, David, phoned us up and uh, he was like, uh, he says, oh, I'm just sat watching these pigeons. He says, that they've done about 45 minutes. I've just seen them. And he's like, they're brilliant. How's yours flying? I says, uh, I think they did about 10 minutes. He went, oh, that's not going to sound good. I said, that's brilliant. <laughs> and I took for a six or Saturday with exactly. it because they were, they were desperate to get down. I can just tell. in a Right, so if you're not training them and they're exercising yeah is it same as you do with your old birds it don't really matter what goes out in the morning or y yeah similar yeah it, ju just similar really um if i remember rightly i'd have the ends out in the morning and the cocks on an evening yeah. um so that's kind of how i did we with young birds yeah. uh, whereas old birds it were more like cocks in the morning but no reason you just location on their shed which way they went out mm. Mm. obviously i've been to marks the uh, young birds sections are outside of each other sliding door they've each got a little aviary yeah, uh, so. on the front where they trap into yeah uh, we'll quickly touch on routine wise yeah supplements yeah is it more or less same as old it's birds exactly uh, everything in my shed uh, stock birds everything gets done exactly the same and it's exactly the same chris if i do ever have to medicate from vets i treat every single pigeon i've got everything from stock loft everything so everything gets exactly the same 
uh, all the time. So even if you, let's say you have a vet visit yep. uh, with old birds, yep. and a minor more count of a bacterial infection, yep. so which I think in most cases, I think bacterial infections are, yep. are, are very important to keep on top of. You would give your young birds it, yep. and oh, you stop birds old it. Old birds it, stop birds it, everything. I give everything it, and, and the reason why, because sometimes at vets, Laura will say to me, but Mark, you don't know if they're going to be all right. And I said, well, you don't know that they're not going to be all right, because I walk from section to section. Yeah, and, and, and I walk in, so I'm not going to kind of change my shoes or whatever between them and so on. So what I tend to do is, if I've got a bacterial infection in my young birds, yeah. for me, there's a chance it's in my old birds, it's in my stock birds. So if I treat every single pigeon in my shed, I know I've combated that problem. And that's that's what I do. It costs me more money, Chris, because obviously say, I, I will do. But like I said, I've got a good relationship with her, and she knows my theory on everything, mm -hmm. and and so on. So I believe if you're medicating one, you're medicating everything. And uh, and and uh, something I've I've done for the last few years really, just to make certain that everything's all okay. That's interesting because I've never come across a loft that does that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Feed wise, then is your feed the same as your old birds? Exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll have the depurative um, uh, feed I and that, and then they'll have yeah. uh, uh, the chosen widowed mix um, for the for the rest of the week. And again, same as I said with old birds, if I think I need that, they need fats because of the day and so yeah. on. Then that's what we'll do. So you don't buy into these special young bird mixes, no. It's just we it's we would feed yeah. same as your old yeah. birds would be. Yeah. Right then. Motivation for young birds. I know you've got people boxes, mm -hmm. uh, box perches. Yeah. Is it just a case of letting them run together, putting a few balls in where they've had nests before, uh, or do you try and? when a, a people box is spun round and created a box, to try and tack some onto the front so it keeps them together to keep them calm yeah. rather than being up and down. What do you do? I, I keep things as basic as I can for myself. Um, and so I more than likely will put the bowls where, because they were paired up before yeah. I separated them off, so I'll put the bowls back into yeah. into that, that position. A uh, few of them always choose on the floor, so bowl in the floor. So uh, so in terms of motivation, again, it's Friday. Um, I'll get down there. We've started basketing, I think, around about 4 o'clock time. So I'll have got down, finished work early, got down there around about 2, half past 2, mm -hmm. Give them a drink, a bit of emp, so make sure they've got a drink. Don't forget, we're in summer now, so more than likely it's a bit warmer yeah, yeah. And, and so on. So I want them to have a bit of a drink. So I'll let them have a drink and so on. Go and put the bowls in to the uh, section where the cocks were, mm. the, because that's where they were paired up. Yeah. And, and then uh, let the ends into them. Um, love a straw on floor and so on. Let them all go in, just have a complete freedom in there. They're all in them sections. Open the middle door so they've got the full two yeah. sections to play about and so on, and uh, and walk away. And I, and I, I every race I left them there for probably between forty minutes and an hour, easy. Yeah. Just let them have whatever they wanted to do. Um, in fact, on one week, I think it might have been the first week I ever did it after I'd widdered them and put them back together. I think I left them for probably two or three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was telling a mate of mine, and he said, oh, I wouldn't have left them that long. Um, but I did. Uh, no difference. Uh, they still did all right Saturday. Um, but, um, but yeah, around about 40 minutes to an hour, uh, let them play around. Um, and what I found is, as the weeks went on and the birds got used to it a little bit more, you got some nest balls with straw in. Yeah. But at the beginning, they just ignored straw. In fact, to be honest with you, as they were flying straw, were going all over. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like Alice in Wonderland in there and so on. And uh, but uh, but literally, um, I just uh, and then what I found is is that I had more hens than cocks, and so I would have quite a lot of hens that were not paired up to a cock and so on. And I think I'm about. Uh, maybe fifth, sixth race in. In fact, it was when I won't breed a buyer. Yeah. 
So what I did was I, because um, I had more ends than than cocks, I run. I remember from years ago an old guy telling me this. So I put three nest balls in the middle of the section on the middle of the floor. Yeah. And uh, on the middle of the bowl, so one bowl, two bowl, three bowl, and the middle one, that were four eye bowls, yeah. all sat on top of each other. Wow, you ought to see them all. Ends just diving on top of that, and they, they were all wanted because it were ice bowl. They were leaving where they'd been paired up, yeah, just, and to, going, get just to get onto top of that. And uh, and I thought, and I got the, uh, a check white fly teacock number 47. Uh, he was a pigeon uh, I bred for Doncaster Breed of Ayer. Mm. And I thought, oh, he's, he's, he's all right, he is, <laughs> and, uh, and so on. And I come, and he were first club, and, uh, and wouldn't breed a buyer 500 quid, so uh, that weren't too bad. And he were, if you like, the king of the castle, he were the one that were just on <laughs> top of that bowl. And it was just something um, that I remembered from ages, and it was only because I had all these ends, I'm thinking, you know what I mean, there's only so many cocks for him, and so on. Put, put some more bowls in and see if the ends might take to another end. Yeah. But that's what happened, so just a bit of luck, really. Something else new. I've mm. never not, I've never heard of that one. Yeah. So that is basically the same as old birds. A bit of different motivation there. Mm. So that's a young bird system. Yeah. There's, there's a method in my madness why I don't do young birds any different. Because I, I'm, I'm a big believer in when you're tra tra training a bird into a widowed. Yeah. What you teach them as a young bird, they will carry forward. Yeah. So if your system is exactly the same realistically as yeah. what you do... They're already learning it at a young age. And then maybe then when you get them into yearling stage and you start to do it, they pick it up a lot quicker. Yeah. Um, I mean, how many times do we hear people say, oh, I don't usually score me until around about third or fourth race. That's usually because the birds have started to kick yeah. on at that point. Yeah. Um, whereas I want to win first race to last race. When they taught it, it stays right? Yeah. Which, to be fair, uh, when I've been to a lot of lofts, not necessarily ones that I visit and do videos because uh, I'm working with them on the auction side of things. But a lot of other good lofts I've been to, generally, that's how it is. The system is the system from April till September. Feeding, supplements, everything. Uh, and, it, and it clearly works. Mm -hmm. So that's young birds. We'll move on on next section to results and although it's the 10th of October 2023 the next section will be showing uh, half a dozen or seven pigeons that Mark is putting in for an auction uh, and I'll explain a bit about that when we start the next section. Right this section uh, is going to be about results. We've spoke about his methods from malting time all the way through to end of racing, his supplements, his medication, seven times a year using a vet. Uh, very rarely blind treats, but if he does, it's only for respiratory on headwinds uh, when it's a cold north, north or northeast wind. So we've seen how he races his pigeons. We're going to speak about results. And then after that, we're going to speak about the three main families of pigeons that Mark keeps uh, and what he does well with. And then we'll show seven pigeons, and that's just seven. Uh, I asked Mark uh, if he would like to put some pigeons in an auction due to his results and meeting him this year and the quality of pigeon he's got. And he said he'll only put half a dozen in which he cannot offer any best, any better. He wants to put the best in that he can. So we'll show them after. Results, Mark. Obviously, I've only known you this year. Yeah. Uh, I know of you because Pat Elliott spoke about you. Uh, I started doing, and they're hard to find results from Doncaster Fed because they're not published no. anywhere. But I found one or two. Uh, and what I did see was Mark on the results on a regular basis. Uh, I saw some, I think, first three in the Fed, uh, first four in the Fed or something. And if he hadn't won it, it was always there or thereabouts with on, the, on that Fed sheet. Uh, and then having raced against him this year and got to know him, uh, he's more 
than worthy uh, at, at doing this auction and having this video. Don't seek his own publicity, doesn't bang his own drum, don't write about himself. If a pigeon wins, if he wins the club, he don't plaster it on Facebook. He's not a self promoter. If he was, I wouldn't be sat here. And you know that, and Mark knows that. I'm here because he's worthy of it. And these results, what he's going to speak about, you'll see exactly uh, why we're here. Uh, we all start off, Mark, young, learning, not winning as much. It, when we start out, it doesn't affect us as much as it does. Mm. If you don't win, you kind of accept it. But at what kind of point and what kind of time in your life were you at when you really started to improve, you started winning and and dominating Woodlands Club as, as you yeah. do? What point were you at and what changed? Um, I'd like to think I've always been reasonably competitive, but prior to uh, nearly three years ago, I were in a different career path. Yeah. Nine to five job, actually, a lot longer than that, because I was senior manager and so on. So what used to happen is pigeons had fit in. Yeah. And as we've kind of talked about today, and as like a lot of people will, will listen to and know themselves, is routine is critical, realistically. Yeah, yeah. With any kind of animal, if it's going to be a racing dog, a horse, or whatever it is, whether you're competitive, mm. routine's uh, good. So I've always uh, uh, done all right, but probably not consistently because of circumstances and so on. Um, and not, you know, young family, not always having uh, the money, but I've always tried to buy the best I can. Um, a few years ago, uh, I met a guy, um, which has turned out to be a good friend of mine now, a guy called Paul Thumwood, um, and uh, he was somebody who I picked up on very, very quickly, was a, a, a really, really good stockman. He had his, um, his kind of finger on the pulse around what pigeons were doing what, where they were doing it, and so yeah. on, and just listening and co had a conversation with him. I soon picked up that the line of pigeon he had and the quality we were bringing in, that was something that I would want to yeah. uh, look look for, um, which were primarily the uh, um, the abandoned bulk pigeons. Yeah. Um, the same again, a long-term friend of ours is Dave Roberts, who was uh, at the time, uh, for me, had the best Aaron Coosters in the country. Um, and um, and he's probably more well known for pigeons such as Birthday Boy, um, which I had down from the Safia pair from Brian Johnson's, and a pigeon called Boeing 747 and so on. So he, he had the um, acoustics and were doing very well. And again, I had the luxury of, of uh, his knowledge and his pigeons as well. So a few years ago, things started to go all right. At a bit of a sad time, we lost his daughter came out of the sport for a very brief period of time. But the same thing that drove me out of the sport, I realised it needs to bring me back into the yeah. sport. Because, yeah. you know, when you've had these, like I said, I was six years old when my dad first introduced us to pigeons. They've been in up and down in my life ever since, really. So so about three years ago, um, I started to invest financially and make a change in my career. My career go back to doing what I started my life out as a decorator, being self-employed. So it gave me more time and flexibility around doing pigeons. Yeah. So so probably three years ago, um, I started to kind of, um, uh, my results were more consistent. I've always won races, but I was more consistent in, in terms of uh, what I were achieving. Yeah. So, it, so to answer your question, around about that time is when I really started to kind of think, I'm going to have a go at this now. Um, looked at the systems I were using. Again, you pick things up over your, your lifetime and realise some of the stuff you're doing is still effective now as it were years ago. Yeah. You're just adapting it differently and, and so on. So started to kind of uh, utilise my time more effectively. Um, we've talked throughout the video around not treating blind other than them two occasions. So back in the day, I probably would have just been, uh, oh, I'll treat them with this, I'll treat them with that. And then sometimes three or four weeks down the line, you, you, you're not consistent and wondering you've made it worse yeah. than better. Stop doing things like that straight away. Utilise a vet who knows what they're doing. So that was one thing. Um, I would... Uh, 
I've, I've never been kind of specific around it needs to be a certain corn, it just needed to be a good quality corn. Yeah. So again, I stopped kind of, it had to be Van Robies, it had to be Marimans and so on. It was about what I, I, I thought was was okay. Um, and and then again, I, I purchased pigeons, uh, the Dirk Van Den Bolt pigeons, although I got them through Paul, the red alert lines, which came from Bob Fennick, yeah. um, they started to be my primary line that were doing very well for me, yeah. uh, and still remain to be a significant part of my success. Is the red alert lines? Um, the uh, also within the Ermine Coaster side of things, I were lucky enough to buy a pigeon called Bolt the Door, and uh, Bolt the Door were bred by Gary Cox, as was a daughter of Lady Bolt. I bought these two pigeons in. And, and at the time, I've got the pedigree here, and what it says at the time of our purchasing uh, this pigeon, it says, um, uh, la, 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 is, uh, is now sire of uh, seven first federation winners. So at that time, moving time on, bolt the door, he didn't fill for me last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had four first federation winners from this cock. So no matter how many birds are spread across the country, because I know he's a prolific breeder, the only ones I know about is what the sevens on here and the four I've bred. <coughs> yeah. um, and ironically, I've put a direct sum of his into the auction as, uh, as well. So I started to bring these pigeons together and, uh, and, and they made a, a, an immediate impact on my results. So when we talk about results this year, um, you know, there's some good fancies in our club, most certainly. And um, although our federation is significantly to the east of me, we've had a little bit of luck at the beginning of the year where we had quite a few east wins, <laughs> which, were, which were nice for us and are able to capitalise in, in federation. Um, and uh, so I've topped the federation six times this year, plus second quite a few times. Um, 13, 14 first club um, uh this year um, and numerous other positions often taking first three four five six yeah. and, and, and so on um, and I think it is down to um, you know someone said to me a good friend of mine will say to me how do you know that comment stuff works and I said I don't know but I'm doing all right so I'm not <laughs> going to not do all right with it I do believe the comment stuff changes uh, a, a good pigeon into a better pigeon um, and I do think the line of pigeons that I've got um, are still current. Van den Bulk and Heron Coosters have been around for some years now, but if you have a look at a lot of your top pigeons now, they still go back into the uh, Herriman or the Herman Cooster yeah. pigeons and so on, which are the, led the Van den Bulk pigeons through and so on. There is other lines that I've, I've, I've brought in. Uh, I have a direct son out of um, at Pink Eyes, which is bred by Morrison Broker. Um, that pigeon alone this year has bred me a, a first and two second federations uh, winners. Uh, last year bred me a second fed one or first and second in there. So the, the Pink Eyes side of things is also uh, a, a good line. Um, so the results have started to improve. Um, me, my motivation now is I've got a little bit more time. I do work for children, still really busy life, which is great. But it allows me now self-employed to say I'm finishing at three because that's my routine and so on. So it allows me more time now to do what I want to do. So I think they're probably the significant reasons. Uh, I must say, I think having good pigeons is um, a necessity but unless you're going to work everything else with the good pigeons you're, all you're going to have is good pigeons you're never going to have the results they're a big piece yeah. of the jigsaw the, the, but you need everything else you, to get the yeah. maximum from them yeah and again I'm lucky enough to surround myself with knowledgeable people and uh, without sounding awful sometimes I read on Facebook and I cringe at some of the stuff out yeah, there yeah. Um, I try and help as many people as I can. Um, I, I, I have bred a lot of pigeons for free for people to try and lift people and so on. But I can't advocate enough is that I use a vet because I need a vet. And since I've been using a regular vet, my results have gone up mm. significantly. Pigeons I buy, yes, they do cost a few quid, but I buy what I can afford and so on. 
Uh, I don't reinvent the wheel. These pigeons have been winning before I got them and they'll go on winning if I got rid of them tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. They're really good pigeons, they're tried and tested. Um, every year I try and bring something new in to try and put against my own. So young birds this year, I brought the Gus Jansons in because yeah. I, I like the look of them and they've done all right uh, and so on. And um, and uh, I've brought uh, William de Brown pigeons in this year for stock, for ready for next year. Yeah. Again, just so I don't sit still and try and look at current winning pigeons alongside ones that are also uh, winning at this moment in time. So results-wise this year, six first feds, yeah. which even when wind is in east, it's still difficult to do because the drag of the fed yeah. goes over to Crowell, yeah. uh, which I measured it on a map uh, from where I am, and it is just short 17 mile into uh, the east. And on a southwest wind, it's. And on a southwest wind, it, you know, people go on about, oh, good pigeon. Yeah, they will. They'll have the day, but it's extremely bloody hard. So even on an east wind, you still got to beat drag at fed, which is all into east, by some miles. And Mark's done that on six occasions, on a couple of occasions, first two, first three, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, from the few results I could find uh, prior to joining Mark's club, Mark were on there. It's hard to find Doncaster fed results. And very few of you watching this will, will this will be the first time you've ever seen Mark uh, and heard his name because results aren't readily available and he don't bang his own uh, drum like we've said. But last year and the year before, yeah. several times first fed as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah that's right. I think, um, uh, again, I don't blow my own trumpet, but... Um, I bred a pigeon for Macaloni's called... Oh, we're going to touch on that. Yeah, so I... It, it's a little, and I'll be honest, it's a little bit of a bugbear with me when people breed pigeons and don't get the credit for it. And that's wrong. Mark actually bred... McQueen. Lightning McQueen. Which I've seen this year on Facebook and people going on about it. Mark Trinder bred that pigeon. Yeah, so... So of all this, like I say, I buy pigeons in and times when maybe me racing through personal circumstances has not been good, I've, I've managed to uh, put good pigeons in good lofts and yeah. get good results. Uh, and with Lightning McQueen, is just one of a few pigeons that I've done really well. Um, uh, actually, the full brother to Lightning McQueen, uh, which I, I bred and own, uh, bred Dave Roberts' uh, first open yeah. Uh, uh, classic winner John Birds is top fed numerous times with me pigeons and so on. So, the, the the pigeons, the line of pigeons that I have, are not just exclusive to me flying against my members that I've got here now. I think they're they're a line that I tried and tested elsewhere and and, and highly successful. Yeah. Um, and um, and, and as did when uh, Willie won uh, top federation and called it Lightning McQueen. Um, this was the fastest velocity ever into Scotland, and yeah. it, it's like so. The, the 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 pigeons have the capabilities. Bringing everything else into the equation, you know, the health, the condition, motivation. That is for me where um, the the for me they just stand out. Mm -hmm. Location's always an issue, and there'll be people same as myself will watch a video. Location is good, absolutely for particularly young bird racing and so on, uh, and and. But earlier in the video, I talked about where I do train. I don't ever go past that because that's where I think the pigeons break. break. Yeah. So I think if you can find where your pigeons break in any locations, for me, you don't have to go too far. You, you can literally go to where you think that they break. And if your pigeons can start to break, irrespective of the wind, irrespective of your competition being so far east or west of you, your pigeons can create a line. And if, they can, if they're motivated to go and win a race, they're going to break at the same point. Mm. And hopefully then you'll be a bit closer to leaders. Yeah. And if you win it, great. If not, then you've not. I mean, you know, currently you're flying against arguably the, probably the best sprint man this section has ever seen in Dave Thrall. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal guy and great results and so on. It's really difficult to fly against those kind of people who are at the top of the game. Mm. 
but there's always somebody at the top of the game and yeah. and I think one of the things that everybody has to do is aspire to win for themselves and I think if you, if you think to yourself I'm better than I was yesterday or last week and so on then just keep chipping away at it you don't have to spend thousands of pounds on pigeons it's a combination it's you need good pigeons absolutely but put everything else in like I said I am privileged really to be around people good knowledgeable pigeon men who we talk to we share yeah. things with uh, there's not for me there's no secrets in, in pigeon racing in fact the more simply you make it the better it is yeah. when you make it difficult I think it, it, it confuses things a little bit um, I've tried all sorts over the years uh, with no success um, but things just seem to be getting a little bit better I thank you about for that so would you I know you, you've top fed many times the last yeah. last few years the results I could find you were a constant on them results uh, obviously Dave Thrall is at top of his game yeah He's got every piece of jigsaw, including location. Mm -hmm. But that aside, he's a very difficult man to beat yeah. uh, in this federation. So as well as topping feds, uh, first couple in fed, first three, several times, what would you say recently, we'll not go back too many years because we, we want recent results, mm -hmm. what would you say is the best result you've had in the last three years? I think prestige-wise, it was when I won Northern Classic. Realistically, it was a, a, a day when um, uh, there were a lot of lightning about, a lot of lightning. The weather were, were quite rough, but the wind also was um, allowed, in my opinion, a pigeon to do sixty mile an hour. Mm -hmm. So, like all of us, if we think it can do sixty, you've got to be ready for yeah. sixty mile an hour. Uh, I had a pigeon come, and uh, and she lost a lot of time because as she come. There were literally thunder and lightning as, as, as she come, and all the wattles were dark, so she'd gone through. Yeah. She come down, and, uh, and eventually I got her in and uh, phoned it in as you do, and uh, um, and there was nothing else near it. Uh, mm. She was over hundred yards a minute in front of anything, and uh, and so on. Uh, so that was the kind of the most prestigious kind of result where you think, oh God, you you, you finally won an open, and you don't miss that other. Yeah. But but to be honest with you, I think. Um, this year, uh, I set off this year, and I put myself under huge pressure to 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 do okay. And first old bird race this year, uh, I top fed. That for me is the most memorable one because that set springboarded this season for me, yeah. where it could have been completely different. And you're trying to play catch up, but winning winning the first fed, I knew. Everything I was doing, I'd done it right. Year before, year before that, weren't a fluke. Suddenly, thing, things were were all right, and uh, so that was it. But um, but th th there's been so many. I mean, like a lot of us sit back and if you close your eyes, you can remember the sight of the pigeon coming and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, you came to watch one race, didn't you? Yes, Chris? I did, and right, in fact, yeah. you saw them before I saw them, and uh, and so on, and uh, and we won that day. Um, and, and so on. So there is so many kind of races. It's, it's never about greed. For me, in the enjoyment of um, seeing quite a few pigeons coming at the same time is always kind of spectacular, really, and how they come. Um, not to kind of beat people significantly. We all want to win in racing. But seeing my, my pigeons come from different directions and just flooding into the shed yeah. and so on, it, it, it's a, a fantastic feeling, it really is. Um, so, the, the, like I said, prestigious-wise, it's probably that one, but in terms of how I feel, I think this year, winning first race... Uh, it it we'll set your benchmark for the rest of the year, I, and, I think, and it kept up. Really. Yeah, yeah, it, it did. I mean, there were some weeks our club were nowhere near, nowhere near. You know, we were absolutely decimated in terms of um, times co compared. But you've got to understand, sometimes you can't beat the law of physics and you've just got to beat what you can beat and, yeah. and, and accept it. If you start trying to be disappointed, if you should win and should be amongst them and you're not, that's fair enough. But there's some weeks you're not going to be uh, 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 amongst them, and uh, and I've had uh, I've tasted that pill as well. <laughs> the difficult pill. Oh, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it most certainly can be it's frustrating. <laughs> so that's results. Yeah. We could go on for hours, uh, as as you can with with fanciers like Mark. 
Uh, we'll move on to the next section, which is about his bloodlines, uh, three main families, uh, and then we'll move on to the birds. Right, you can't see it from camera, but below us is lots of pedigrees. So in this section, Mark's going to speak about his bloodlines. We know what he's fetched in over the years. He's invested uh, a lot of money. Uh, a lot of money. Yeah. And I know what bloodlines he's fetched in. We're going to speak about the three main families that he spoke about. What are his main stays. And he's fetched a few in recently. William De Bruin, uh, Gus Janssen's. What are the three main families that that you class as your mainstay families? Yeah. So currently a stock, I think I've got six grandchildren of Red Alert. And the reason I've got them is because each and every single grandchild has yeah. bred winning pigeons uh, for a few years now. Mm. For myself and other pigeons, wherever I send them to, they've, they've, they've gone on. And I do think... When you look at the history around Red Alert and how and what he did before, well, he's actually dead now and so on, but uh, um, a fantastic, phenomenal line. Um, so it speaks volumes that when you've got a pigeon like that, you really want to go and get yeah. some bloodlines. I purchased a full brother to him at one point, but to be honest with you, I'm never a big believer in you have to have direct children of the winning pigeons. I think the bloodline is the bloodline. Yeah. And every pigeon we have is always a grandchild or a great-grandchild of something and so on. So I'm not never precious about having to have exact children of pigeons. As long as the bloodline's there and you're getting from a trustworthy source, mm. for me, that's the most important thing. The Irvin and Coosters pigeons, the bolt lines, so obviously I've said, I've got a, um, a, a daughter of uh, Lady Bolt. Uh, I own uh, Bolt the Door. I've uh, had a direct son of uh, Better Than Bolt. So I've got a lot of the Bolt dynasty within my yeah. stock loft and they continue and have continued to breed Winning Pigeons Club and Federation and so on. So the Erwin and Coosters and also within the Erwin and Coosters which is the birthday boy lines, which is come um, through originally through the Sapphire pair, and again Brian Johnson, Brian Johnson stuff. Uh, yeah, D Dave Roberts. Um, uh, he he named and uh, uh, owned birthday boy until he sold him on. Uh, I was lucky enough to go and uh, pick children I had a son and a daughter out of birthday boy mm -hmm. and uh, and that line again has has, has come through um, the other line on Irwin and Coosters is a pigeon um, which uh, was called Boeing 747 um, which again is the 747 is obviously its ring number and so on um, but again when you look at 747 and looking at the pedigree and Husky in there and uh, Rossi's in there, Olympiad obviously all three and so on you start to see that this line also has been highly successful yeah. and the um, the other one, uh, just a random pigeon really, again um, if anybody reads in terms of syndicate lofts this pigeon is half brother to um, I think it's called Rihanna at syndicate lofts who's, who's been a phenomenal breeder for uh, for them. This is half brother whereas, um, so this is a direct son out of Pink Eyes mm -hmm. uh, and I think syndicate lofts is Pink Eyes and full set whereas yeah. the father on this one is a full brother to um, uh, John Edwards, a sane bolt, so a bolt on that side of things. And again, this is a Demea line. Yeah. Um, so this pigeon, uh, I call him Pink Eyes for obvious reasons, uh, he has been consistently paired up until this year um, onto um, a direct daughter of Boeing 747. Um, and the fed results from them uh, are absolutely tremendous. Yeah. And I put two, a son and a daughter, for the auction in there. I must say the son was never going to be into the stock loft. Uh, last year as a yearling, I was terrorised, as I've said about, with the sparrow And this cock got significantly damaged by a sparrow and never raced again as a result of it. Um, it's fully fine, uh, but he wouldn't race because he was so yeah. nervous. So he, he's in there, fully recovered, and his sister, which I did breed for um, stock. So, 
the Eamon Cooster, the Dirk van den Bulk, uh, the Red Alert lines, obviously when you go through the pedigrees, you've got all the, the main pigeons in there, you've got Kittle in there, you've got the Good Road, I've got Return Good Road, um, all the main birds I've got coming through the, 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 the pedigrees, uh, which again I've had the privilege of utilising people like Paul's and Dave's uh, ability to go and buy these birds and I'll just pick children up from them or grandchildren yeah. from them and, and, and have done uh, uh, very well. Um, the Gary Cox's lines, like I said, the, the daughter of uh, Lady Bolt, um, I've got her, they're old pigeons now, she's still laying. I used a pair up last year and it got a bit warmer because she's a 13 pigeon. Um, there's a, um, a child of hers in there in, in, in here as well. Um, so the, the the lines fundamentally go around them, but they're not fundamentally around specific one, two or three pigeons. The stop loft I've got, everything that hasn't been producing good pigeons uh, have, have, have moved on now, yeah. have moved on. I've had a few years of where sorting things out, I wanted to make certain what I had. And the only way you can sometimes test your pigeons is by... Um, sending them away from yourself yeah. um, and uh, and I do that quite a lot I breed good fanciers a set of birds try them from it tell me what they think mm. and uh, results have come back um, very very good you know numerous first feds all over the place with the uh, pigeons that uh, that I've bred so I know this line is very current a lot of people have this line out there um, these have just seemed to blend extremely well and um, and, the, and the results have, uh, have equally been as good um, so yeah we will be doing a part two obviously this one is a, a long long one uh, not much uh, if any uh, videos of, of pigeons or, or being it loft but this is information I like to do this with fanciers to get the systems and everything uh, we will be doing a part two where we go to loft, we look at the race birds, we look at the birds who are currently winning that have top fed this year in 2023 and we'll go through the breeders as well. Uh, but they're the lines that Mark has invested heavily, uh, quite heavily uh, in these pigeons but they're working for him and they're working for others. Uh, me and myself have got seven ends off Mark uh, that I'm doing a little experiment with uh, for next year uh, and I must admit the class very intelligent pigeons they've only been out a few times getting them settled they are late we're in October but yeah I can tell straight away they're intelligent pigeons and uh, the bodies on them and everything they, they seem to have got it so hopefully uh, mm. they'll do well for me in my little experiment. I think that's one of the things you've just said there Chris is, is that it is one of my things to handle a pigeon with a, a, yeah. a great body yeah. a body that is actually all from that's a powerhouse yeah. that actually can actually burst out there and, uh, and, and do the damage I mean only recently due to age I've just parted with a um, uh, grandson of Blue Leo Don Leo mm. um, just moved them on to other fanciers multiple winning pigeons and, and so on um, there's a pigeon that is just starting to show its head really with me yeah. at minute and um, uh, again this, this pigeon was bred as a young bird for me by, uh, by Dave Roberts um, and it was paired on from a, a cock uh, called Red Marauder which I believe he got from Paul Beaumont and Red Marauder went on to breed quite a lot of good pigeons. I've got a blue hen and I call her Blue Marauder and, um, and, and, and to date every pigeon I've bred off her a scored. There's not, there's, there, there's no like, oh, it's nearly done and so on. Every single pigeon. I've only had a couple of years, so bred off her. So it's into a long time, and I don't have a lot of birds off her. But John Birdsey won his club this year, and I think he was second fed with a, 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 a direct, I think, son of, um, of Blue Marauder. And then this year, what I've done is, I'll, when I separated my stock birds, um, I left Blue Marauder in with a cock, and... Um, and uh, the, there's one, uh, there's a son offer, and I brought him. He's the only this year yeah. young bird um, I, I brought. But he, so the father is a um, grandson of Red Alert uh, on one side, and he is um, on the other side. He is uh, a grandson of Don Colo uh, Don Coloni, uh, Wild Wind Samson Girl on the other side. 
um, and the mother is a, a direct daughter of Blue Marauder. So Van den Bulk, Ermen Koester, Red Alert, which is obviously the Van den Bulk as well, all brought into one pigeon. And so far, that particular line, Blue Marauder line, is just starting to make me sit up and like, wow, it really Notice is. It. Really is. You know, I spoke about in, in breeding, putting birds straight back to each other, then pair will stay together. They've done, yeah. they've done phenomenal. Nothing's not scored off them so far. So the strike rate... It is 100%, 100%, 100% on it, you know. Um, so so I, I think the Blue Marauder uh, side of things is is going to be um, uh, one of uh, my me, me strongest lines coming into this uh, 24 season. But we'll see. We'll come back next year and see if he's right. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll, we'll move on now and we'll introduce the seven pigeons. Uh, that Mark will be having in a, a very small but very niche uh, auction. Uh, the reason there's only seven, I never asked for really more, no more than ten really, to try and keep the quality there, but Mark's knocked it down even more to get what he feels is the very best quality that he can put in. So we'll. Uh, I'll just say this one thing on. on. So bolt the door this year. He's not. He's not filled. Um, so yeah. everything I've had off him, I've been keeping back for myself because yeah. everything really does well from him. So I've put a direct son, and he's the full brother to a cock who's top fed for me twice this year, uh, who I'll retain for stock myself just because, like I say, bolt the door has not been filling this uh, last twelve months. And also uh, the daughter of Lady Bolt as well. She does lay, um, but she lays when it's warmer, warmer weather yeah. and so on. So I've put a daughter, well, yeah it is, it's a daughter of her in as well, which normally I would have retained back for myself. So I'm offering out there pigeons that, um, it's hard to say you can guarantee, because you never can guarantee, yeah. can you? Yeah. But I'm very, very, very confident these pigeons, or barring the one off the Blue Marauder, which is this year's, and the Pied Cop, which is out of Pink Eyes, and Daughter of Bowen, who was a racing pigeon, all the rest was specifically bred for Stock Loft. Yeah. So hopefully they'll be all right. Right, in this section... As we've said, we're going to show the seven pigeons that are going in Mark's auction. Uh, as I said in the last section, there's only seven. I never ask for no more than ten from a fancier. Sometimes I get twelve, uh, but that's my max absolute maximum. Mark's knocked that down even further and put seven in. And the seven, that, as we've said, there is no guarantees. You pay your money, you take your chance. All this crap about it'll go on and fill your loft full of winners. I've never said that and I never will. But Mark says that these seven pigeons should, in the right hands, go on and breed good pigeons. The bloodline's there, you've seen the bloodlines. So he's put his absolute best in that he can. That's why there's only seven and he didn't want to put any more in. So these are the pigeons what are going up for auction. We'll have a trip to the lofts later in part two and we'll look at the winners containing these bloodlines. Okay, so this is a pencil pied cock, uh, 2021 pigeon. He's on his last flight at this moment in time. He's out of um, a grandson of Red Alert paired onto an Ermine Coyster N. Um, Full brother to this pigeon has, has won quite a few times. I bred this pigeon, again for my own stock purposes realistically. Um, fantastic strong back, good strong wing. As you're opening that wing up there, you can see how strong that, that wing is and as it's pulling in. Really up front, muscled up pigeon. Uh, this is your typical of your Red Alert and your Ermine Coos across that I, I currently house. Um, for me, will be a good asset uh, to, to be able to breed from because it's got the Herman Coyster. The mother is a double granddaughter of Birthday Boy, the, um, and on one side and on the other side, it's a Kill, Curtis Wall Lunt and uh, yeah, Curtis Wall Lunt hen, which is owned by Dave Thrall. And on the father's side, it's like I say, Red Alert uh, and Paul Thumbwood bred the father. So, this is the first pigeon. Uh, lovely strong pigeon. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, next one, another 2021 pigeon. This pigeon here is a direct son out of Bolt the Door, paired onto an Ehrman Coyster N, and on lot one, it's the same mother. So it's an Ehrman Coyster uh, mother uh, from a double granddaughter, a birthday boy, and also a daughter out of a Curtis Wall uh, hen. Um, bolt the Door, when I purchased him, seven first federations, this lad's brother himself has got two first federations this year. Uh, I bred him, everything off Bolt the Door I've been keeping back uh, for myself. Um, he's a full powerhouse as this pigeon. He's all up front, a real good handful. Um, and again, like a lot of this line, I do genuinely believe would be a good asset to the uh, majority of the stock lofts around. Uh, around. He's got a fantastic strong wing. Again, you can feel the muscles as I'm opening his wing up there. Um, good depth. Fantastic for those theories on terms of squareness in, in there. He's got a fantastically good strong back. Uh, his balance is superb. Like I say, he's never, never been out at shed. He's always been bred. He was bred for stock and then that's where he's been. Okay, Blue Pied Cock, so this is a direct son um, out of um, my uh, son of Pink Eyes. Uh, mother is a direct daughter of uh, Boeing 747, so Herman Coyster, De Mayer on, uh, on the other side. This is the cock I spoke about in the video who had the unfortunate uh, orc attack as a racing pigeon last year and uh, was removed from the racing shed and, uh, and has sat in the stock loft ever since. Uh, full brother to this pigeon this year alone has had first federation and two second federations. Uh, other pigeons have been uh, w within um, the top few birds when I've took first one, two or, or whatever in federation. So a really good line. Again, a very strong pigeon. You find with the pink eyes, um, they are kind of flighty in, in, in a sense where they're really strong and burst into go. But um, it's a lovely, lovely pigeon. Again, if you look at his wing, it's quite a strong wing. Good breeding lines. Again, in the very strong back, good vitality. That's your pink eyes. This is the only uh, 2023 young bird that I'm offering out here. This is a, um, a direct child out of a pigeon I call Blue Marauder, uh, paired onto a red cock, which is a grandson of Red Alert. Um, this pair together as a 100% strike record, every single pigeon that have been bred off these have, have, have gone on uh, to, um, to either win or within the, uh, within the scorecard that would have won if it went for uh, loft mates. It's going to be a blue cock as you can see, he's quite young, he's currently got uh, five to go. Um, but again, he's a really strong pigeon, he is only young but I think he'll be perfect ready for, for January breeding. Um, he's been in the stock loft and as I've said in, in the video, for me, I think the Blue Marauder line is arguably going to be one, if not my strongest line, moving forward, particularly paired to this Red Alert cock um, from Paul Thumbwood. So this is the first of three ends that I'm offering out. Um, this this n uh, two thousand and twenty n. Um, this mother is a direct daughter of Bowen, and the father is a direct son of Birthday Boy. So Herman Coyster all the way through. Significantly successful lines on both ends. Both parents to this pigeon. I've got brothers and sisters that have won, as have other people. Anybody who knows Dave Roberts with that kind of line, there's been a complete success of um, people flying the Ehrman um, Coysters through these two lines that have done significantly well, really have. One of, if not, the um, best Ehrman Coyster lines around, in my opinion. Again, really strong wing, 
good strong, lovely strong back. Great character, lovely shape. A beautiful, beautiful one. Okay, this is the um, full sister to the blue pie cock who is uh, who I've got into uh, another lot, which is so. This is a granddaughter out of pink eyes. So the father is a direct son of pink eyes, paired on to a direct daughter of Bowen. So on my first, uh, sorry, on my uh, last lot, which is the hen from Bowen and birthday boy, it's the same mother. So it's half sister to my last lot. Um, this hen fantastic muscle texture similar to her brother which is the blue pied cock again great lines um at the pink eyes um and again with the ermine coyster going through lovely strong back perfectly breeding Okay, check 10. Uh, this is 2022 N. Uh, the mother to this is a daughter out of Lady Bolt, and the father is a Dirk Van Den Bulk, uh, bred by Thorpe Paul Thumwood from his Bob Fennick pigeons. Uh, included in the size pedigree, you've got New Kittle in there, you've got Sagan there, and um, you've got expensive Kittle in there um, as grandparents. So a very, very, very well-bred pigeon like i say the the lady bolt is um, a tremendous line for me uh, i've not too many of them left she does lay each year so i'm hoping to get some more for this year but pairing to this young cock the cock the father to this pigeon has bred first federation winners uh, for uh, other people who have bred out there uh, a, a very good uh, a very good line she's got great character again great muscle tone um lovely wedged pigeon um, wing, she is. She's on to a uh, last flight. Uh, again, very strong in its sense. Good, good breeding feathers, if you like that. Lovely muscle tone. Lovely strong. And for me, she's going to be a remarkable kind of pigeon. Um, and she would have been most certainly staying with me because I'm not letting anything go from uh, the Lady Bolt or the Bolt the Door, other than in this auction. Right, so that brings to a draw the uh, part one. It's a very long video, but if you've got time and patience, I'm sure you'll learn something from it. Uh, as I've said before, I only deal with people who are honest, and I genuinely believe Mark is. I've only known him a short time, but you get a good feel for people. His results are outstanding. His family of pigeons uh, quality. Uh, he's told us everything, he's not held anything back and I can assure you of that. Uh, we both believe there's no secrets in pigeons. It's about a jigsaw and every piece being in the right place. Now I asked Mark late in the year if he'd take part in an auction. It was too late for him to, to breed pigeons specifically for it. Uh, but he, he did promise that he would put something in uh, that's his very best lines and these pigeons would be stopping with him other than the fact that he didn't really want to let me down uh, we have become friends and he said I'll put you some in it'll only be a small number but I'll put you some in and they will be the best he's got so you've seen the birds you've heard his results you've heard his system two pigeons I mean they're all fantastic but I always like to mention if one catches my eye certainly that hen that was the last lot the one before this one the one before this is lady bolt paired onto a van bulk cock yeah that's the hen that caught my eye yeah this one yeah she's a class hen check 10 and this is the uh, the young bird which mark mentioned is from his his lines what he really thinks are going to be uh, Phenomenal, what they are, they have started. Yeah. Phenomenal. 
Uh, obviously as a young pigeon, don't let that put you off. You've still got five to go. But he's a class pigeon this. He really is. All these pigeons are quality, they've got the blood. You can see from the pedigrees what will be on the website. Uh, along with photos of these pigeons. It's a very small but class auction. The fact that he's kept numbers low and not just given me anything and everything to put in tells you that they are quality uh, and that's why there's only a few. So cheers buddy. You're more than welcome. Thank you very much.